Good afternoon. Are we ready? Yeah, I'm sorry. We have just uh, some recordings to do first. Thank you. Uh, I'll let you know. Uh, Sergeants, can we start our recordings? Computer started. Cloud is started. Sergeant Lugo, can you give us the opening, please? Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. At this time, with all panelists, please turn on your videos. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair Ayala, we are ready to begin. Thank you, thank you. Uh, good afternoon and thank you all for joining us. My name is Diana Ayala and I am the chair of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. We are also joined uh, today by my colleagues on the committee, council members Brennan Chen, Ku, Koslowitz, Powers, Menchaca, Lander, and Rivera. I'm not sure if I missed anyone, but if I did, I will come around to you. Um, today, we will be hearing a number of bills related to third-party delivery platforms, such as Grubhub, DoorDash, and Uber Eats, and how they treat their contracted delivery workers. The five bills include 2288 in relation to platforms providing insulated bags for delivery workers, and intro 2289, allowing delivery workers to set distance and route limitations for themselves, both of which are sponsored by Councilmember Brennan. We will also hear intro 2294 from Councilmember Lander that would establish minimum payments per delivery. Intro 2296 from Councilmember Menchaca that would establish standards of payment for delivery workers. And intro 2298 from Councilmember Rivera that would ensure that these delivery workers have access to toilet facilities. Throughout the pandemic, food delivery workers have been on the front lines. When lockdown orders and indoor dining restrictions were put in place, it was the delivery workers that helped keep restaurants open and New Yorkers fed. Politicians and the public recognized them as essential workers and heaped much deserved praise on them. However, beyond the rhetoric, these delivery workers have little substantive support. Most of our city's delivery workers are immigrants and many are undocumented. This means that many missed out on stimulus checks and other forms of government assistance during the peak of the pandemic. They struggled to get PPE and during the curfew, some of them found themselves target of police enforcement despite being recognized as essential workers. The package of bills that we are hearing today aims to rectify some of the concerns raised by delivery workers. As independent contractors, they are not protected by the city's vast protect worker protection laws. Similarly, some of these conditions set by third party delivery platforms force these workers to rush around the city, delivering orders in unrealistic timeframes just to maintain good customer ratings, but for very minimal pay. I look forward to hearing from the platforms and the delivery workers themselves on how these bills will improve their working conditions. We will also hear two additional bills today. Intro 2163 from Councilmember Reynoso would allow restaurants to add a surcharge to their bills provided they pay their tip workers a $15 minimum wage. The city council had already enacted legislation that would allow restaurants to add a surcharge of no more than 10%, while restaurants are prohibited from operating at uh, maximum capacity and for 90 days after. The purpose of this law was to help restaurants in their economic recovery spurred by the health emergency. Intro 2163 would repeal this law, replacing it with a, with a new surcharge provision, linking it to tip worker wages. Like restaurants, tip worker, uh, tipped workers in the hospitality industry have also been negatively impacted by the economic downturn. According to some reports, the restaurant industry lost 43% of its jobs in 2020, and even those who were able to stay working reported a severe downturn in tips. Unlike back of house staff who receive a standard minimum wage, workers in the front of the house like servers and hosts rely on tips to supplement their wages. This means that there are times when they earn well below the standard $15 an hour. Furthermore, research has shown that there are tipping disparities along racial and gender lines, meaning that on average, black women earn $7.75 less than their white male counterparts. By linking restaurant surcharges to a base salary for tip workers, we hope to mitigate some of these inequities. The final bill we will hear feedback on today is intro 2311 from Councilmember Powers, 
Under this bill, restaurants would have access to customer data collected by third party platforms. This data is one of the most important tools restaurants can use to develop marketing strategies and customer relations. However, under the current contracts, third party delivery platforms do not allow restaurants to retain this data, depriving them of key information to develop and grow their businesses. The hospitality industry was hit hard by COVID-19 pandemic. And as the industry begins to recover, this committee will ensure that delivery workers, restaurant staff, and restaurant owners have the protections they need to succeed. As you can see, we have quite an agenda to get through today. And I thank you in advance for your patience as we ensure that every stakeholder gets their opportunity to speak. I'm going to invite the various bill sponsors to make a short opening statement on their bills. But before I do that, I wanna thank committee staff, legislative counsel, Stephanie Jones, policy analyst, Noah Mixler, and Leah Skripiak for putting this hearing together. I will now turn it over, I'm sorry, to which council member? I think it's council member Brennan. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thanks to legislative staff. And obviously thank you to my colleagues, uh, Councilwoman Rivera and Councilman Menchaca, who we've been working very closely on this issue along with obviously the leadership of the Workers' Justice Project. Uh, so this is a big day for us uh, here in the council. Today we're hearing two pieces of my legislation that, that I've introduced, uh, which seek to provide just basic protection and benefits to delivery workers. Uh, both these pieces of legislation recognize two important and unfortunate realities uh, to the nature of third party delivery work. One, that their out of pocket costs required to begin this work are substantial and they act as a barrier to entry for many workers. And two, uh, that many workers are penalized for failing to have adequate equipment and or for attempting to exercise basic control over their workday. So intro uh, 2289 aims to provide workers with a very crucial protection, the ability to set the distance that they wish to travel while delivering and the ability to refuse to cross a bridge or a tunnel without being penalized for refusing an order. Uh, intro 2289 is a result of the stories that we've heard from the deliveristas who, while delivering for certain apps, are sent all over the city on their bicycles, sometimes traveling multiple miles be between single orders, and sometimes being sent over a bridge or a tunnel into another borough without warning. We've even heard from delivery workers who, uh, one delivery worker who was delivering in Manhattan, he was sent to an address in New Jersey on his bike. For many of these apps, when a worker decides to reject an order based on its distance, they receive a lower rating from the app's internal algorithm, and it has a negative effect on their ability to receive future orders. So it bears repeating that these workers are independent contractors. They should not be required to go wherever these apps assign them for fear of negative repercussions, especially if it jeopardizes their safety. Second, lastly for me, uh, intro 2288, it's very straightforward and simple. It would require third-party apps to provide workers with insulated bags for food delivery at no cost to the worker. This legislation aims to minimize the cost that a worker incurs on the job. Uh, these workers already supply their own bicycles, their own helmets, their own safety equipment. And this, there's no reason that they should also need to provide bags to keep food warm during delivery. Uh, we've heard stories of delivery workers who uh, lacking delivery bags and whatnot receive low ratings when the food arrived cold to their customer. Again, a worker should not be penalized because they can't afford to purchase an item that is a necessity for the job. Uh, this cost should really rest with the apps. So again, I want to thank my colleagues and especially the incredible workers who have organized to get us here today, especially the Workers Justice Project, and thank my colleagues, uh, Council Members Rivera, Menchaca, uh, and their legislative staff for their hard work on this package. And of course, uh, to uh, Chairwoman Ayala for all your leadership and getting this done today. This is a big day for us and for the workers. So I appreciate it. And thanks for letting me uh, talk on these bills. Thank you, Council Member Brennan. We've also been joined by Council Member Reynoso. Um, we will now turn it over to Council Member Lander, prime sponsor of intro 2294 to deliver our opening statement. Council Member Lander. Thank you so very much, uh, Chair Ayala. It's really an honor to be one of the sponsors today, along with Council Members Rivera, Menchaca, Brandon. And I'm excited also about the tipped uh, worker legislation uh, that Council Reynoso is carrying that I also strongly support. I want to thank you for having this hearing. 
I want to especially thank the workers for their organizing and their courage and their making their voices heard out in the streets and today in this hearing, I really look forward to hearing from them. Delivery workers have been feeding us throughout the pandemic, but too often the app companies have been starving them. Many delivery workers, they perform hard, dangerous, essential work. Imagine riding 10 or 12 hours in the heat today, and yet they earn far less than the minimum wage, sometimes even just four or five dollars an hour. Uh, DoorDash, Seamless, Uber, and Instacart have exploited the independent contractor loophole to shortchange workers. This is supposed to be a city where every worker earns at least $15 an hour, and we do not have to allow them to continue shortchanging workers. For Uber and Lyft drivers, by requiring that the Taxi and Limousine Commission set a per-trip minimum, we've guaranteed that Uber and Lyft drivers can earn a living wage of at least $17.50 an hour. Uh, my legislation, intro 2294, We'll do similarly for delivery workers that will require the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection to establish a per trip payment for food delivery workers in order to guarantee them living wage pay. Now, we may hear from Uber or DoorDash that they can't afford it, but Uber's revenue from delivery service soared 215% to the first quarter of 2021, and they even increased their take rate, what they take that restaurants or, del or delivery workers don't get from 11 to 14%, that's hundreds of millions of dollars that went to Uber that could have gone to delivery workers. And DoorDash's revenues jumped threefold. Their CEO received a stock package worth $400 million in December. They can afford to pay their delivery workers a living wage. Intro 2294, we'll make sure we get it done. I support all the other bills in this package and I'm honored to be a co-sponsor. Thank you, Councilmember Lander. We've also been joined by Councilmember Kalos. Um, we will now turn it over to Councilmember Menchaca, prime sponsor of Intro 2296, to deliver an opening statement. Uh, thank you. I, I want to just first start by saying thank you to Chair Ayala and Speak Corey Johnson. Without them and the committee staff and central staff, there's no way that we would have gotten to this point. And I just want to say thank you in a moment where so much of what we are trying to do, we are doing with our immigrant New Yorkers, uh, there's no way we can do it without you. And so both you, Speaker Corey Johnson and Chair Ayala deserve so much credit for today's hearing. Now, what I wanna uh, lift in this conversation is the sheer fact that so many New Yorkers have gotten rich on the backs of our immigrant workers for many years. COVID accelerated the conversation that we're having today where the apps have taken advantage. And you're hearing from the sponsors about how the different ways we have benefited as New Yorkers without justice. And so these bills that you're hearing today are about that. My bill is really focused on regulating the apps. The apps have charged workers, essential workers, the deliveristas, uh, for paying, paying their salary uh, using non-banking options. Uh, this is something that was brought to my attention over a year ago in Sense Park, and we submitted an LS request and here is the bill. The bill will also ensure that workers get paid on time. We know from workers that you're gonna hear from today who have not been paid in months. Uh, and at this point, I think there are a lot of uh, tactics that apps will use so that they never pay workers their salary. That's going to end. And I'm just really proud to be here with this committee. The workers are going to tell their story. Let's listen to that. Uh, and let's move these bills fast. And so I'm, I'm asking all my council member colleagues, especially those that have been on the front, um, Justin Brandon, Carlina Rivera, Brad Lander, uh, council member Ayala and Chair Ayala, and so many more that have uh, joined this, this effort. Let's make this happen. And glad to be here today. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember uh, Menchaca. We will now turn it over to Councilmember Rivera, who's the prime sponsor of Intro 2298 to deliver an opening statement. Hi, can you all hear me okay? Okay, great, sorry. Trying something new. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the committee for holding this important hearing. For the past year and a half, while we battled the COVID-19 pandemic and fought for a just recovery, delivery workers have put their lives and livelihoods at risk reporting to work every day to keep New Yorkers fed and restaurants afloat. They have been and continue to be just as essential to our city's survival as our healthcare heroes, yet they have not been awarded even a degree of the honor and respect that they deserve. My colleagues and I introduced this package of legislation drafted in partnership 
with the Workers' Justice Project and Los Deliberistas Unidos to begin to address the dangers, abuses, and inequities facing deliberistas. On average, a delivery worker works 12 hours a day, seven days a week, earning a grand total of $300. That is less than $4 an hour. When they need to take a break or use the restroom, they are denied basic courtesy and treated with hostility by some of the very same restaurants kept open by their labor. They are no safer out in our streets where they face robberies and violent assaults at the hands of individuals who target them for their valuable e-bikes. Without protected bike lanes and safe street infrastructure, the Deliveristas continue community has lost several workers to traffic fatalities. Today is a historic day because after a year of organizing, you will hear directly from the workers fighting for dignity in their workplace, the streets of New York. My bill intro 2298 would require all restaurants to provide something seemingly very basic, access to bathrooms for delivery workers who are picking up a delivery, except in restaurants where accessing the bathroom would create a serious health or safety risk. The Liberistas have single-handedly kept restaurants across the five boroughs in business and yet are often faced to go an entire 12 hour workday without any access to a bathroom. Just outside of my own district, we learned of a restaurant charging delivery workers an astonishing $5 to use their bathroom. The rights and protections we seek to codify and defend in this package are just the minimum of what delivery workers deserve. And it is far past time that we as a council stepped in to help deliver justice where it is long overdue. Thank you again, Madam Chair and the committee. Thank you to Speaker Johnson and my colleagues for their advocacy and their collaboration. I'd especially like to thank the Workers Justice Project and Los Deliberistas Unidos for their partnership and for entrusting us with this fight. Following today's hearing, I look forward to getting these bills passed. And finally, this fight did not start in the council and nor does it end here. I call on our city agencies to step up and do their part to ensure these workers are regarded with dignity and respect and provide a safe, supportive environment to work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member Herrera. Uh, we will now turn it over to Council Member Powers, prime sponsor of intro 2311 to deliver an opening statement. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chael. I'm going to keep my comments a little shorter since I know you have a lot on the agenda today. Uh, but thanks for take, giving me time to speak on intro 2311, which requires third party food delivery services, which are entities that are providing restaurants with online order and delivery services to share in certain information with restaurants with, with about customer data. Um, we're living in an era where more and more people are turning to technology and the cloud is and as an intermediary to traditional brick and mortar services, there is truly an app for everything these days. And I know I take advantage of them as well, um, but we do wanna make sure that we strike the right balance and equity between those that hold the information and those that supply the goods and services. And that's ultimately the intention of my bill. The goal is to allow for more information sharing and transparency between the platforms that retain and, and, and hold that data and the restaurants who rely on them but you'd be able to use that data when it comes to marketing and understanding their business. Um, we have heard from folks about their concerns in terms of protecting privacy data and uh, eager to hear suggestions from stakeholders on how to best address those concerns and reach a bill that helps do all of the above. Um, and I just have to say, this has been such a hard year for our restaurants and our local businesses. And this is a really good opportunity for us, again, to look and think about ways to keep them surviving here in the city, but also give them a better opportunity to compete and to be able to stay in our communities for a very long time. And so that's the goal of my bill here today. And I want to thank uh, Chair Ayala for having this hearing and the speaker as well for putting the bill on the agenda. And I want to thank all the colleagues who so far have signed on to the bill and encourage everyone to take a look at it and sign on and uh, we'll look forward to hearing comments. So thank, thank you, Chair, and uh, look forward to your testimony. Thank you. And before I turn it over to our moderator, Stephanie Jones, I just wanted to take a moment to remember Francisco Villalba Vitinio, who uh, was murdered in my district in April. Um, Francisco was a delivery uh, worker um, who after his, um, his day of work, was sitting in a park bench when he was uh, murdered from what we presume was um, someone trying to steal his bike, um, to steal his livelihood. And I wanna thank 
and acknowledge the work of Los de Liberistas Unido and Workers Justice Project for um, not only you know uh, shedding light on, on on Francisco's story, but also uh, offering their support to the family and to the entire community. Um, with that, I now turn it over to moderator Stephanie Jones for some procedural items. Thank you, Chair. I am Stephanie Jones, counsel to the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing, and I will be moderating this hearing. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called as I will periodically be announcing who the next panelist will be. At this hearing, we will first be inviting testimony from the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer your questions. For all panelists, when called on to testify, please state your name and the organization you represent, if any. We will now call representatives of the administration to testify. We will be hearing testimony from Sandra Abelas, Acting Commissioner of the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. We will also be joined for questions by Stephen Etanani, Executive Director of External Affairs at DCWP, Vincent Maniscalco, Assistant Commissioner of Highway Inspection and Quality Assurance of the Department of Transportation, and Miranda Alquist, Assistant Director of Legislative Affairs of the Department of Transportation. At this time, I will administer the affirmation. Administration panelists, please raise your right hands and I will call on each of you individually to respond. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Abelis. I do. Thank you. Executive Director Atanani. I do. Thank you. Assistant Commissioner Maniscalco. I do. Thank you. Finally, Assistant Director Alquist. I do. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite Commissioner Abelas to present her testimony. Good afternoon, Chair Ayala and members of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. I'm Sandra Bellas, Acting Commissioner of the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, or DCWP. And I'm joined today by Stephen Netanani, our agency's Executive Director of External Affairs. We're also joined by our colleagues from the Department of Transportation, Vincent Maniscalco, Assistant Commissioner of Highway Inspections and Quality Assurance, and Miranda Alquist, Assistant Director of Legislative Affairs. Chair Ayala, it's a pleasure to see you again. And I look forward to working with you and members of the committee on these significant issues impacting New York's delivery workers. I've been with the agency since 2014, and prior to stepping into my current role, I served as the first deputy. Before joining DCWP, I worked at the New York State Department of Labor, enforcing labor standards and ensuring the health and safety of public employees, and at the Attorney General's Office in the Civil Rights Bureau protecting our immigrant communities from fraud. This is why I joined DCWP, because I consider our mission of protecting consumers and workers an essential part of ensuring equity and justice in our city. The agency licenses about 59,000 businesses and individuals in approximately 50 different categories. We enforce consumer protection, business licensing, and workplace laws that serve New Yorkers throughout the city and offer programming that increases access in our city to free financial services for New Yorkers. DCWP's Office of Labor Policy and Standards, or OLPS, enforces our city's workplace protections, including New York City's paid safe and sick leave and fair work week laws. And it administers the Freelance Isn't Free Act to protect freelancers' right to get paid, and conducts vital education and outreach to workers and businesses on their rights and responsibilities. Throughout the pandemic, DCWP received thousands of complaints and inquiries about workers' rights in New York City. We have investigated and brought successful enforcement actions against employers that violated the rights of essential workers, even up to the point of illegal firings. 
We've also adapted throughout the pandemic to focus our available tools and resources on the most pressing concerns for workers, including providing referrals on critical economic supports, developing new resources to help workers navigate reopening, and prioritizing the swift resolution of complaints to ensure workers can access their sick leave and receive any compensation to which they're entitled. Another major step our city is taking to protect our city's workers is the passage and implementation of groundbreaking just cause protections for tens of thousands of essential workers in our fast food industry. For too long, workers in this industry have faced arbitrary firings, at times dismissed for no reason at all. Just cause, as a new frontier in workers' rights, will bring greater stability and equity to our city's fast food workers by ensuring there are disciplinary processes in place before a worker is terminated. Turning toward the legislation at hand today, I'd like to take a moment to recognize the incredible efforts and sacrifices made by delivery workers during one of the most difficult times in this city's history. Delivery workers helped carry the city through an unprecedented ongoing public health crisis. When many of us were isolated in our homes or caring for loved ones, delivery workers were among the essential workers who kept going to work every day, ensuring that New Yorkers could have access to meals, and other goods without having to leave home. And while many industries shrank, the number of workers doing deliveries through third-party apps has increased. To that end, DCWP supports protections for these workers. We've worked closely with the partners that the council has engaged with and are always encouraged to see that workers' rights are at the forefront of conversations in the city. We look forward to working with the council on these important bills to ensure they'll provide meaningful protections to app-based delivery workers, while also making sure they are enforceable once passed. Introduction 2288, which requires a third-party food delivery service to provide insulated food delivery bags for each of its bicycle operators at the company's expense, would be under the purview of DOT. The administration supports the intent of this legislation to reduce financial burdens on workers and to ensure food is properly stored. Delivery cyclists are under significant pressure when traveling far and fast throughout the city to deliver our food. Improving their working conditions also enhances safety on the city streets, helping keep the cyclists and all New Yorkers safe. Introduction 2298 would require food service establishments that utilize delivery workers to provide those workers with access to the toilet facilities, provided that in doing so, there's no risk to health and safety standards. The administration supports the intent of this legislation, which is consistent with existing employee rights to bathroom access under the Federal Occupational Safety and Health Act, and extends similar protections to app-based delivery workers. There may be challenges in enforcement when determining whether a violation has occurred based on information offered by the worker or the business. Therefore, it'll be a priority to develop clear and understandable standards for workers and businesses and for the agency to be able to assess violations. Ultimately, our city's delivery workers deserve a right to bathroom access. Introduction 2289 would allow a third party delivery worker to specify to their food delivery service the maximum distance the worker will travel and their restrictions on traveling over bridges or through tunnels. This bill directly addresses a significant safety concern of workers and we support its intent. Introduction 2294 would require DCWP to commission a study of working conditions for third-party delivery workers, as well as determining minimum per trip payments for these workers to be established by rule. While DCWP does not have information on the inner workings of the industry or the staff required to develop minimum pay rates, we do look forward to discussing how this would work with the council and other stakeholders to ensure it translates into real benefits for delivery workers. Introduction 2296 
would require DCWP to establish standards for payment for third-party delivery workers and establish a program to provide real-time assistance to delivery workers in disputes with third-party service platforms. DCWP supports the intent of this legislation to ensure delivery workers are properly paid and looks forward to working with the council on this bill. These bills establish a new administrative framework with a significant investment for this group of workers. While DCWP currently lacks the expertise to effectively regulate this industry, we know it operates through a highly sophisticated and constantly changing technology. Additionally, the industry itself continues to adapt very quickly to the market demand for delivery services in the midst of the pandemic, which could mean they're also capable of evading regulations if enforcement is not carefully constructed. To address these concerns, the agency will need to work closely with the council and stakeholders representing our city's delivery workers, restaurants, and other industry experts. Similar to other laws the city has implemented, stakeholders can assist the agency in understanding how this industry operates and help develop standards of protection for delivery workers. And these stakeholders could work with the agency to develop recommendations on an ongoing basis to ensure that we as a city are taking necessary steps in the short term to protect workers while we analyze these technology platforms and also set the most appropriate standards for the industry. The structure for Introduction 2294 provides an example of what this approach could look like, ensuring DCWP can gather the needed expertise to set up enforceable standards that are responsive to working conditions in this fast-changing industry, and allowing the city to protect and enhance the rights of these delivery workers for years to come. Introduction 2163 would permit restaurants to impose a surcharge of up to 15% in addition to the stated price of individual items, provided that a restaurant appropriately discloses the surcharge to its consumers and provides their tipped workers with an hourly cash wage that is not less than the minimum wage set by the state for New York City. The administration supports the intent of this bill and we look forward to further discussing with the council DCWP has long advocated for an end to the state's two-tiered wage system to cure the serious equity gaps in current wage and hour law. Action must be taken by the state to eliminate the two-tiered wage system for tipped workers, which is why we've called on the governor many times to eliminate this system for restaurant workers. Lastly, introduction 2311 would require third-party delivery apps to share customer information with the restaurants with whom those customers are placing orders. Unfortunately, this legislation was only recently added to today's agenda and the administration is still reviewing its language and impact. One final concern with implementing any new enforcement contemplated in these bills is our current work implementing just cause protections and other new offices. We'll certainly need additional resources to ensure we implement any new mandates effectively, though it's too soon to tell exactly what resources would be required. Ultimately, we welcome the Council's efforts to improve the lives of vulnerable workers in our city. The present time, when many employers are experiencing a labor shortage, we hope that these efforts in our continued partnership can demonstrate that we must increase wages and improve benefits so that these workers can continue to be a part of the economic recovery in New York City. The administration has continuously advocated alongside thousands of workers for a $15 minimum wage and groundbreaking legislation such as Just Cause Protections, which brings stability to the lives of so many essential workers. This also includes our agency's priority to bring the consumer protection law into the 21st century. Introduction 1622, with common sense penalties to protect consumers from predatory corporations and tools to protect consumers conducting transactions over the internet and in languages other than English. As always, we value the council as our partner in ensuring that workers' rights are a priority for the city with sound and resource protections for our workers. Effective enforcement, whether on behalf of consumers or workers, 
depends on a well calibrated regulatory structure that deters the most harmful activity so that breaking the law in our city is not just the cost of doing business. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you, Commissioner. I will now turn it over to questions from Chair Ayala, followed by questions from other council members. Chair? Thank you. Um, considering that we're, we're hearing so many bills and that we have so many of the bill sponsors uh, on at this moment, I would love to give those members an opportunity to ask questions first. Um, I think that I see council member. Councilmember Menchaca. Can you hear me? Am I coming in? Yes, we can hear you. Wonderful, thank you. So uh, thank you, thank you chair for this opportunity. And I guess uh, uh, to, to the commissioner, I wanna, I wanna focus on my bill that really requires a prompt, mm -hmm. uh, a timeline for payment and a removal of any fee connected to salary. And can you talk a little bit about other instances where you have seen this kind of uh, enforcement from the city that we can look at and bring into this conversation? Because I think that's, you, you support the intention of the bill. And, and I think you were looking more at how do, how are we, how do we enforce this? Do you, does your, has your team thought about other models that we can bring into this conversation? Thank you so much, uh, Councilmember Menchaca. I think that, you know, overall, we do have the sense that this is a, a, a new industry for our agency to look into. I think that we understand that many delivery workers may work for multiple services at the same time, and it might be difficult for them or confusing to track uh, their payments and make sure that they're being paid correctly. As we learn more about how these different platforms operate, we'll better understand how the fees and payments are actually charged and calculated. And then we can figure out how best to, to mediate that. I think maybe the closest analogy would be the Freelance Isn't Free Act. But again, it's really early for us to tell um, what's the best way uh, to implement such a thing. Okay, because uh, I, I know we're, we're gonna have some ideas as well. And, and I think part, part of this is the the fact that there are many many different apps but that shouldn't preclude the city from creating a regulation that says here's what you have to follow and then allowing for a legal recourse from the advocates working with each of these workers to be able to say sue the city or not the city but sue the um with the support of the city the the apps and so i think i think this is this is kind of what we're we're thinking about as well um, maybe the next question I have for you is the banking options. So much of what we've been trying to do with the NYC is to link our immigrant communities to bank accounts, um, but also to really understand that sometimes bank accounts are not going to be an option for immigrants and to create other ways for banking to be, to be created. And so maybe, um, uh, if you can talk a little bit about that and what you might be thinking working with your other commissioner colleagues. Sure. Um, I think that when it comes to the unbanked, and certainly we've seen a lot of this from um, the work we've done in our Office of Financial Empowerment, is, is seeing just what you mentioned, where for some people, um, they haven't been able to find the right banking products um, that are suitable for their situation. We do offer free financial counseling throughout the city, and we've continued to do that throughout the pandemic. Um, also offering some remote options for folks while it was unsafe to do so in person. And so we would really be looking with them to see what would be the best options that we could offer people um, in terms of banking products that don't charge exorbitant fees and that are transparent in terms of their offerings so that we can help match people up, educate them, work with them on their particular situation. So I think we would work with our Office of Financial Empowerment in that regard. And then lastly, uh, I think one, one, one question that I wanna drill down on are other models in which the city has told a third party 
uh, system, I want to be kind of general about it, that basically says you have to pay your workers on time. Is there anything that exists right now within the city in terms of relationship, uh, including potentially itself, and what kind of regulations that we can really set for, for these apps that are really kind of growing in, in scope as well? I think we're all anticipating the world of this third party. This is why we're trying to fix it here, but this is a longer labor movement um, work that we have to do, but it, it specifically looking toward a um, kind of salary timeline requirement. You know, that's a great question. I'm not entirely sure of another model that's so similar here in the city. Um, and again, as I mentioned, these third-party apps, we know these are global companies. They're, they have presences in cities throughout the, throughout the world. Um, they have different platforms that they use and different models for how they set their pay rates um, for their delivery workers. And so we'd want to work really closely with the stakeholders, especially the ones that you've gathered here today. Time to is gain... oh, Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, just finish that and then I'm okay. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, bear with me. This is my first one. Uh, to, to gain a better grasp of the work and then develop the clear standards um, with, the, with the advocates on, on what we should do for this particular bill. Wonderful. And again, this is your first one, so welcome and looking forward to working. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. I see that Council Member Lander also has his hand raised. If any other council members would like to ask a question of you and you have not yet raised your hand, please do so using the Zoom raise hand function. Hey, council Member Lander? Before council Starting member, time. Council Member Lander, give me one second. Sorry. I uh, just want to recognize that we were also joined by Council Member Diego and Dr. Ramos. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank you so much. And Chair, thank you for uh, letting us ask our ask our questions first. Um, we appreciate that a lot. Uh, Commissioner, welcome. It's wonderful to have you. Congratulations on your new position. I know you've been uh, working in this field and in this agency and, and protecting workers' rights a long time, but it's great to have you as our, as our commissioner at DCWP, so thank you. Um, and thanks for your mentions of uh, Just Cause and the Freelancers and Free Act and the work that you guys are doing to diligently enforce existing uh, uh, worker protections and you know we appreciate the point that if we're going to expand them we need to have you have the resources to be able to to deliver on them that's clearly true um so i'm going to ask a little about 2294 i appreciate your praise of the approach of having a study and digging in and really understanding uh the so I, i'm glad that you like that approach but i guess i wasn't clear in your testimony whether that means you support the bill um so can you say a little more about if you like the approach if you agree that time is needed to develop uh, an approach on minimum pay, um, you know, what is there we need to work on to make sure we can we can pass this legislation and move forward? Absolutely. And yes, we do appreciate the concept of having a study to develop the appropriate standards, because as I mentioned, this is a very quickly evolving industry. And we know that the platforms operate differently in how they set uh, their payment rates. So the one, I think, concern that we have is just the timeline uh, to make sure that it um, is adequate and it and it does a comprehensive review of what's required for to set minimum pay rates, um, and as you mentioned, um, the resources for the kind of procurement uh, we would need for experts to conduct this study and determine also how the access um, can be uh, delivered in terms of the data from the third party app, since we know this is like primarily like data um, driven industry. Great. All right. Those are all really helpful. I think timeline resources are things we can negotiate and we're definitely going to have to work on the data. In the case of the TLC, the Uber and Lyft uh, for hire vehicle app, we had the data being provided to the TLC uh, pursuant to a law that we already had. So um, that is something that I think we can work on uh, together as well as, as resources and timeline. Um, I just, uh, have you had a chance to, you know, to look a bit at the uh, that study that Mike Reich and James Parrott did, uh, you know, uh, uh, coming out of the legislation that that the council passed for minimum trip rates and minimum pay, therefore, for for hire drivers. Yeah, we've certainly looked at that as a potential model. Again, we're still in the very early stages of 
thinking through uh, how it would work in this particular circumstance. Um, the other piece that we would welcome a partnership with you on is also identifying the correct experts that we would want to tap for this kind of uh, expertise, because we know that, again, like this industry is very particular, and, and we would love to uh, work with you on identifying who the proper experts would be uh, to figure out the best way forward. That sounds great. We're going to hear from some of them today, the workers themselves. Uh, I hope some of the app companies will testify because even though they may resist some of the legislation, they are critical uh, partners here. If we're going to make this work, we have to make this work uh, with them. And then obviously there'll be other experts that we can tap, uh, tap into. Okay. Um, but yeah, I guess generally you agree that, you know, in a city with a $15 minimum wage, we want to make sure all workers are earning at least that, you know, after other expenses per hour so they can feed their families and pay their rent. Yeah, we absolutely think that all workers deserve a certain basic level of support. And we know how expensive it is to live in this city. Um, and so we want to do everything that we can uh, to work with the council and figure out how best to, to implement the intent of each of these bills. Thank you very much. We look forward to working with you after this hearing to move forward to pass this bill and then move forward to guarantee that living wage for delivery workers who so who so you know been there for us and we really have to be there for them. Thank you very much and thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, seeing no other council member hands raised, I will turn it back to Chair Ayala for any questions. Chair. Uh, Commissioner, do you do we have any any information? the uh, the average rate per trip uh, payment is at this time? And is that rate comparable amongst the We actually do not have industry data at this time, uh, but that's one of the things that we would seek to learn through, for example, the study that Councilmember Lander is suggesting. Can you explain, uh, can you explain for us the ways that VCWP has engaged delivery workers to educate them uh, to educate workplace rights and provide them with financial education through OFB. Sure. Um, so, because we know how essential delivery workers have been throughout the pandemic, DCWP has worked to provide ongoing education to workers and also field inquiries about worker rights throughout this pandemic. One issue that um, we know has come up is certainly, as you mentioned access to financial counseling. Um, and so, like I said, we've worked with our providers to make sure that even throughout the pandemic, there have been some remote options for folks so that they can make appointments and go over their budget and go over their, their debt and figure out what their goals are and get that kind of support and help. Particularly with deliveristas, we would want to learn a little bit better about what kind of targeted outreach would be necessary to help them, the languages that they will require and other questions that they may have so that we can target and tailor our outreach specifically to them um, if these bills move forward. So has DCWP engaged with, with the groups? We have had ongoing relationships with the partners that you've mentioned here, for sure. I think that the one thing we haven't honed in on is really the needs of this particular subset of workers. Um, our focus has been on continuing the paid safe and sick leave, which has been, you know, so critical during the pandemic. And then, like I mentioned earlier, um, setting up the infrastructure for the just cause implementation that will be happening in the next couple of months. Okay. And the thing that's so important to just reaffirm in this is that this is new work for DCWP. And on top of that, it's such a dynamic industry. And we want to make sure, as uh, Acting Commissioner Abellas mentioned, that we have all the information on the ground so that we can effectively contemplate and work with council on long-term policies that are going to be very impactful for this industry. Um, and that means convening stakeholders, uh, the, the apps, the workers themselves, the folks that I'm sure will be testifying in, in forthcoming panels and and you know that's something that that we're going to be uh, leaning on uh, to help uh, inform you know work in this space. Has any effort to convening the groups though happened before to the hearing? This is a, this industry is like growing really rapid. So we, I mean, we've had 
an opportunity. I, I would say the last year or so has been pretty eye-opening in terms of the disparities in pay and really the injustices in, in how the delivery workers are treated. So, you know, I'm just trying to gauge whether or not prior to the hearing there has been any attempt to engage with uh, the different groups um, and what, if anything, has come out of the conversations. Because obviously this goes beyond, you know, pay equity issues, right? There are also safety concerns. There's so many other layers to this. And I, I you know, so would love to kind of get some insight in terms of what the thought process is, you know, at DCWP in relation to this industry and, you know, um, all of the things that are happening. Yeah. As I mentioned, like we work closely with the Workers' Justice Project, New Immigrant Community Empowerment, and, and other worker groups. Uh, to make sure that we are preparing information about the laws that we enforce and making sure that they know about their rights and responsibilities and how to access additional economic resources that are available to them. And we would do the same thing here. You know, whenever we uh, roll out uh, some new protections, we'll work closely with our partners to make sure that we're getting to the most frequently asked questions, that we're, we're translating them into all the appropriate languages um, and that we're making it as plain language as possible so that it's really accessible to the work community that we're trying to target. And that's the approach that I think we would look at here. Yeah. Any we're, we're so, I'm yeah. sorry, Chair. I, I just want to say we're so happy that the council has introduced these bills. I think th these bills are going to allow us as, you know, the, the hearing process is, you know, closer to the beginning of the legislative process than, than the end. And I think this is going to allow our agency to kind of coalesce around some of these ideas and principles that are being raised by the sponsors of these bills so that we can engage with the stakeholders explicitly around some of these concepts going forward. Um, and again, I think that we focus a lot of our, you know, attention on work protection and wage. Um, however, there has to be a conversation about, you know, the safety, right? And, uh, in, in performing these jobs, you know, as you heard a few minutes ago, you know, I, I, I had an unfortunate incident where I had a delivery worker murdered in my district um, because someone was trying to steal a bicycle. A couple of days after that, you know, there were a number of, you know, delivery workers trying to cross over the Willis Avenue Bridge who were highlighting um, what they, you know, uh, were saying was an attempt um, by um, some pedestrians uh, to to rob them of their 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 money and and really you know expressing how this was a common occurrence. So um, really, how are we engaging uh, with the groups and with the workers in a way that allows the community to really understand what their rights are, um, how they're communicating and reporting these instances to the you know to the NYPD, um, and whether or not you know there are other ways that we could be helpful in ensuring that they're doing their jobs as safely as possible. Yeah. And we're certainly open to working with our sister agencies and the PD and DOT on any safety issues that come up. And, and like you said, to make sure that workers really know where they can go to get these resources, how they can go and file reports, how they can um, let us know like where the trouble areas are so that we can work together to make sure that those, are, those concerns are being addressed. And just to clarify, because I'm not sure if I heard this, are there any existing worker protection laws that delivery workers are covered by? You know, that's something that we're looking into. Our current workplace protection laws really tend to skew towards the traditional employment model. Like, like I mentioned earlier, other than freelance isn't free, um, which, you know, we worked very closely with Councilmember Lander on. Um, most of the work that we have done, you know, tends to apply to a traditional employment model. So with um, the independent contractors, we would have to look at, you know, what kinds of protections um, make the most sense and how do you implement that in this kind of industry? Um, can you explain how, the, in relation to um, the restaurant for charge bill, can you explain how the tip and cash uh, is work for restaurant workers? I'm so sorry. I only caught the first part. I know you're talking about the restaurant surcharge bill, but I didn't hear the exact question. Can you explain how the cash wages work for restaurant workers? Oh, sure. So 
The legislation um, that requires tipped workers, uh, as defined by New York State Code, be provided at least the minimum wage, not including their tips. So we think that currently the back of the house workers should already be receiving the minimum wage. Tip sharing, which could benefit the back of the house workers, is currently prohibited by the state. And so we've called upon the state to address that inequality. Um, we think that, you know, because we've advocated for so long for an end to that two tier wage system, um, you know, we are looking forward to working with the council on this particular bill. Currently, the law department is also reviewing, um, and we want to circle back. Uh, once they've done their analysis uh, to make sure that this bill has the intended impact, which is that if you charge the surcharge, that you are also making sure that you are paying people properly and at least the minimum wage. Absolutely. Do you have any concerns that this bill will create any uh, type of pay disparity, um, discrepancy between front and back uh, of the house staff? You know, it's possible. I think that, again, we would um, call upon the state to really take action here so that um, all, the, all the workers are paid appropriately and at least get the minimum wage. Um, again, I think that, you know, we'll work with the law department and with the council um, to see what the impact of the bill might be. Um, and then has again in relation to the same bill. Has DC uh, WP received any uh, customer inquiries into the current COVID nineteen recovery surcharge permitted on the local law? Sure. So since the COVID surcharge was implemented in October twenty twenty to support struggling restaurant owners, and we do know that restaurants were particularly hard hit by the pandemic. Um, DCWP has been responding to complaints related to restaurant surcharges, although it doesn't always, the complaints don't always specifically reference the COVID uh, surcharge. It could be that the restaurant labeled it differently, um, but we have issued only two violations where the restaurant actually specifically referenced the COVID surcharge, but we've done uh, dozens of inspections to check on that. Uh, okay. Uh, now, in, in regards to, does anybody, I, I, I am concerning my colleagues, and I see that Council Member Reynolds so has raised his hand, so I will allow uh, Council Member questions. Starting time. Thank you, Chair. Um, just wanted, to, look, if uh, it seems like there is a an agreement between all of us that we should be doing something uh, to help the back of the house workers that don't receive any tips. It seems like it's something we agree with, uh, but you're saying that we should leave it to the state to take care of it or that it might be a state issue. Um, but should we, should we find that we can do something, that your law department agrees that what we're asking for is legal and can be done and we are not preempted by the state, then it is my understanding that you would be supportive so because it achieves the goals that we've all set forth here? I, I certainly, in the agency, the administration certainly supports the intent of this bill. I think what we wanted to make sure is that in our analysis that it does have its intended impact and I think my references to the state are really um, to, to note just their role in setting um, the minimum wage throughout the state and also to enforce uh, that the minimum wage is being paid to workers. And so for us, we certainly look forward to working with the council and the law department um, on other approaches to get to the same ending place, which I think we all certainly agree on that workers should be getting at least a minimum wage. Yeah, but um, what other approaches is there to guaranteeing that tipped workers get a minimum wage? Because what we did, uh, and I just want to let the council like just be aware, what we did was we allowed for restaurants, um, one second. We 
we allowed for restaurants to get an increase in how much money they bring in, how much revenue they bring in. Um, and after getting that done, um, there was no increase, no opportunities given to the tipped workers or to the people in the back of the house. We solely assisted the restaurants. Um, and and that's, a, that's an issue. Um, one, I don't think the surcharge we put out actually was used by restaurants. And I don't necessarily think that restaurants thought it was helpful in any way. Um, you know, I, the outdoor dining bill was more of a way to help restaurants than these than these surcharges. I don't think these surcharges are actually helpful to restaurants per se. Um, but if we're going to look out for the restaurants, which I think we should be doing, and allowing for the surcharge to exist if they think it's a value, but why not also take care of the workers that were working during COVID um, and were like frontline workers having to put on masks and put their lives in danger and receive the same pay that they were receiving prior to uh, to, prior to COVID. Um, it was a higher risk with no reward. Um, while we're looking out for the interests of the businesses, which I think is important, and I don't want to take that away from them, we should also be looking out for the workers. So I just want to know, again, if we're able to achieve the goals that we're setting forth, um, which is to help these tipped workers, and it is legal, what the intent of the bill is actually legal, then what I'm understanding is that the city would have no objections. Well, I think that Part of what you're raising is that um, workers also have to complain oftentimes that they're not getting paid properly. With respect to how broadly the COVID surcharge was used, that's, also, that's an interesting question. I actually don't know how broadly it was used and, and perhaps the council has more data on that. Um, but yes, if, if after the law department's review, we certainly support the intent of this because we do wanna see people getting paid properly. You know, at the moment, it's really incumbent upon workers to make sure that, you know, and if they do reach out to our office, I want you to know that we will, you know, work with them and make sure that they have the information that they need uh, to be able to even if even if we can't do anything about it at the moment, we will refer them out to the right place um, so that they do get support and help because we do agree with you that, you know, these workers have been working throughout the pandemic um, and that they should be paying at least the minimum wage. Um, and and it's, it's a balance of supporting both the restaurants and also their workers. Yeah. And, and the last thing I would say is that we have something called the itemized, itemized pricing that exists for restaurants, um, that, I mean, for supermarkets. Um, it's not a bill that we have on the docket, but it's a bill that existed in a time when... Uh, when we had no scanners, right? There was no scanners. So we had to put a price on every single item. Now that we have scanners, it doesn't make any sense. And if we wanna help businesses and supermarkets and bodegas, this is the um, most often and commonly used fine by DCA for restaurants, uh, for bodegas and supermarkets, which have that, that has no more value because everything we do or we've done moving forward is technology-based that is just scanned. A scan will always scan the correct item and always make sure the price is correct. Um, and I just think that is something we should think about. And I hope DCA can be supportive on getting rid of um, the number one fine being given to restaurants and bodegas in a time when we need to be looking out for businesses, not hurting them. But um, thank you so much for this being your first time. I really appreciate you being here um, and I appreciate you answering all of our questions. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And we're open to working with the council on, on making uh, updates like that. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Council Member Reynoso. So, uh, Mr. Retonani, did you have a question? Did you have something that you wanted to add? Warren, I saw your hand. No? Steven, no question? OK. All right, thank you. Um, I just have two, two final questions. So regarding intro 2289, um, there, there obviously there have been some concerns. Could could the ability to opt out of the bridge and tunnel crossing reduce deliveries in certain New York City uh, neighborhoods? Is that a concern? You know, I think that although 2289, it could definitely be a key safety protection for delivery workers. As you mentioned, there are definitely safety concerns that delivery workers have when they have to travel so far um, and under time pressure to really maximize the efficiency of their deliveries. We're not entirely sure how the platforms uh, dictate, you know, the trips that delivery workers take or how they set those routes or under what conditions. So I think you know, we would need to learn more about how, uh, what the parameters are 
um, that the different platforms allow you to set and then see, you know, what the potential uh, ramifications of that would be. So I think it's too soon probably to answer your question. I, I would imagine that the same is, is true with the next question, but I have to ask anyway. Um, the, the, the bill also prohibits decreasing the number of trips offered to delivery workers that are consistent with the parameters the workers have set. Does DCWP foresee any issues with ascertaining whether or not the number of trips offered is less than what it should be? Well, I think, again, we would want to learn more about how the apps operate because, for example, if you were to set certain parameters, but they're too restrictive, then that in and of itself could limit the number of trips that you might take. And so learning how the apps operate and how much uh, leeway a driver has to set those parameters would be really important for us um, before we recommend um, which ways would, would really fulfill the intent of the bill. I hope that helps answer your question. Somewhat. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I'm not sure if we have any other questions. Um, I don't see any. And Chair, I just want to add, you know, thank you so much again for having us participate in this hearing. It's these issues are really important. We really value uh, this opportunity to bring to the forefront the, the hard work and the sacrifices that the delivery workers have made. And we look forward to working with you on figuring out some of the details um, and how we can support uh, the intent of all these bills. And we appreciate your willingness. We want to be a partner in this. Absolutely. Um, I actually have no further questions. Assuming that there are no other uh, no other questions, I will turn it over to the moderator. Thank you, Chair. Um, we will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that, unlike our typical council hearings, we'll be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given two minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelists should use the raise hand function in Zoom, and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you, and the sergeant in arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. We will now, I would like to now welcome Angelou Kukuza to testify, followed by Gustavo Ache, and then Ligia Hualpa. Angelo? You may begin. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Angelo Kakuza, and I am the organizing director of the Transport Workers Union of America, speaking on behalf of our 150,000 members across the country. I'm here today to testify in full support of Los Deliveristas Unidos and all New York City app-based worker food delivery workers. Our union leadership stands alongside these workers and their demands for dignity and respect while providing an essential service to both their customers and the restaurants who feed our city. These food delivery workers have worked tirelessly with many of you to see introduction of a series of bills targeting the services they provide. And TWU is providing testimony today to ensure that these bills or any other food bills that come forward for food delivery workers see their way to the full council floor for a vote as soon as possible. Of particular interest to our labor organization is Bill 2298, which seeks to require food establishments to provide toilet facility access to delivery workers. It is almost absurd that in 2021, there would be a need for such a mandate. And there's absolutely no reason why this bill should not be passed unanimously by the council. It is ridiculous that in an almost post pandemic world, we actually have members on community boards like Community Board 7 of the Upper West Side of Manhattan refusing to support such a bill for fear of upsetting restaurant owners who take for granted the services food delivery workers provide to them and their so-called customers. When you have community boards out there who think that food delivery workers should not be using a toilet, the apps have won. TWU members, whether a New York City bike share mechanic, an airline baggage handler like myself, or a subway train operator are not unlike food delivery workers. We are all essential, and as a result, we expect restaurant and bar owners to truly value the services being provided by app-based food delivery workers. They risk their lives working throughout the pandemic to feed New Yorkers, and they continue to do so as businesses bounce back. The least restaurant owners and staff can do 
is allow them to use the bathroom when needed before picking up food they will deliver on their behalf. As a lifelong Brooklyn resident, I am Time imploring you not to waste another day in passage of these six bills. Thank you. Thank you, Angelo. Before we continue, I see State Senator Jessica Ramos has joined us. Um, Senator Ramos, would you like to testify, please? Hi, good afternoon. Yes, I'd be honored. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, good afternoon to everyone, Committee Chair Diana Dalla and members of the Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing Committee. I'm New York State Senator Jessica Ramos, and I represent the 13th District in Queens, where the largest concentration of food and hospitality workers in New York resides. Many of my neighbors work as deliveristas, which proved to be an essential service throughout the pandemic. And I'm thankful we're having this important conversation today that will surely lead to improvements in their work lives. Since I have been in office, I have introduced and passed legislation to legalize the main tool of their trade, e-bikes, in the state legislature. And most recently, I've championed legislation to bring cargo bikes to our streets as a means to reduce truck traffic and therefore carbon emissions in our air with the added benefit of addressing occupational injuries and illnesses that arise from long-term, literal backbreaking work in the delivery industry. The Liberistas are my neighbors and the backbone of my community. Their safety and their autonomy is my number one concern. Over the past two weeks, DoorDash, Uber, Seamless, Grubhub, and other delivery apps have schemed to introduce legislation behind the backs of these workers. They want to amend our state labor laws to thwart their rights on the job under the guise of collective bargaining. One of the most egregious parts of the so-called right to bargain bill is that it undercuts delivery workers' local organizing efforts. And I am here in support of the Liberistas' right to organize on the city level and their fight to set limits on their travel, to a living minimum wage, to transparency in salaries and tips, access to bathrooms, to provisions of equipment like insulated food bags, and certainly the means to recover stolen wages. Most workers have managers to supervise them, but baristas are disciplined by an algorithm. Currently, if a worker denies making a specific trip, they run the risk of being deactivated by the app for an undetermined amount of time. There are no clear guidelines on this, and there's no formal process to change it. So intro 2289 by council member Brennan will allow these workers to put their protection and safety above the bottom line of these apps. I also call on the city council to pass council member Landers intro 2294 so delivery can make a living wage. Just like in 2018, when the city set a minimum wage for app-based drivers, the city's initiative to set the minimum wage for delivery allows for a true accounting of our city's unaffordability. Right now, there's no rhyme or reason set for how much workers will be paid per trip, and there are no guidelines from the government that specifies deliveries to pay. I also support intro 2288 by Council Member Brennan to provide equipment to deliveries to perform their jobs, and intro 2296 by Council Member Menchaca to eliminate fees and hurdles for workers to receive their tips. It really is a moral failing on the part of the, the delivery industry that we actually need to legislate how to allow deliveristas to use restrooms in the restaurants they are picking up food from. It's an utter embarrassment that we need to legislate basic human dignity, but that's what Council Member Rivera is doing in intro 2298. None of your efforts here in the city council would be possible if app companies get their way with that so-called right to bargain bill they want to introduce in the state legislature. Drafts we've seen destroy the right for cities to improve their labor standards, preventing bodies such as your own from passing any legislation that relates to app-based companies regarding, and I quote, all matters. It is my hope that if and when this dangerous piece of legislation is officially introduced, you will continue to stand shoulder to shoulder with me and my neighbors, the deliveristas, to stop them. I applaud the City Council Committee on Consumer Affairs, Chair Ayala, and Council Members Rivera, Lander, Menchaca, and Brennan for working directly with the deliveristas to sponsor these bills. And I preemptively thank all the council members who will vote in their favor. 
thank you. Thank you all for caring about my neighbors. Thank you, Senator. I see that Councilmember Lander has his hand raised. Councilmember? Senator, I just wanna make sure that we thank you for being such a champion of your neighbors and all our neighbors and those workers up there. Uh, you know, As you noted, if that legislation that has not yet been introduced would pass, many of the pieces of legislation we're hearing today would be preempted. I know for certain that my bill to set a minimum pay standard would be and your courage and voice and just tireless fighting on behalf of workers in general uh, and today on behalf of delivery workers really uh, stands out and then that you would come to our hearing you know and pay us the honor of uh, talking with us about the laws we're considering uh, we really appreciate so thank you for being a champion up there well thank you council member lander look we have to stick together for those of us who truly believe in worker power and their ability to organize for themselves i want the city council to be able to protect them in these ways it's important that the city council has the power to do this our cost of living is just so high here in new york that it, their pay really should not be determined by their employers especially when they have no real union to represent them so thank you all for your efforts Thank you, Senator, for joining us. Next, we will call on Gustavo Ache, followed by Ligia Hualpa, and then Teodora Flores. Gustavo? You may begin. Muy buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Gustavo Ache. Soy repartidor de comida y miembro del Proyecto de Justicia Laboral y líder de los Delibristas Unidos. Hoy es un día muy importante para nosotros los repartidores de comida porque hoy hemos luchado para poder ser escuchados como trabajadores esenciales. Hoy el Consejo de Municipal de la Ciudad de Nueva York tendrá la oportunidad de escuchar los testimonios de mis compañeros que mantuvimos a flote esta ciudad. Hemos sido reconocidos y aclamados como trabajadores esenciales, pero eso no significa nada para nosotros. Por esta razón hemos iniciado con este primer paquete de legislaciones que nos, permit, que nos permitirá hacer este trabajo con dignidad y respeto. Esperamos tener respaldo de todos ustedes para mantener la protección necesaria para seguir repartiendo comida, medicina, despensas de alimentos y otros productos esenciales, puesto a que estas aplicaciones cada día son más populares. Hay mucho por hacer y por nuestro trabajo, que sea digno, Y nosotros los trabajadores hemos estado enfrente de esta pandemia y aquí seguimos en la calle repartiendo comida sin importar si hace calor, frío o a qué hora sea. Y la ciudad no nos reconoce como esenciales, como hechos, son solo palabras, nada, no son hechos aún. En este paquete de legislaciones será un paso para las aplicaciones empiecen a darnos respeto que nos merecemos. También asegurarse que haya una transparencia en los pagos de las propinas. En lo personal he visto las irregularidades de estas aplicaciones. Es frustrante cómo ver que las aplicaciones hacen y desaparecen nuestras, eh, aparece, desaparecer nuestras propinas. El sistema también de los restaurantes también. Es duro ver que las gratificaciones de los clientes a veces no llegan a nosotros. Hemos hecho ese trabajo arriesgando nuestras vidas en la calle. Hoy yo... Eh, Sé que muchos no entienden el valor de denunciar estas irregularidades por el, por el miedo, pero aquí estamos haciendo visible nuestro movimiento y esperamos contar con el apoyo de ustedes y en verdad lo merecemos que nos traten como esenciales. Es como lo han dicho que somos y creo que sí lo merecemos que este paquete pase para que el trabajo de los repartidores sea un trabajo más digno. I'm going to be briefly translating. Uh, my name is Gustavo Ache, a delivery worker, member of the Workers' Justice Project, and the leader of Los Deliveristas Unidos. Today is a very important day for delivery workers. I don't want to talk about the city running. We have been applauded as essential workers, but that's not enough for us. For, the, for this reason, we introduced the first package of legislation that will make our work more dignified and more respected. We hope, we hope to get your support since this package of policies will guarantee 
some protections for us. The workers were delivering your food, your medicine, your groceries, your essentials. These apps have become more popular every day. There is a lot more to do to make our labor more dignified. We deserve protections because we are the essentials who are in the front lines of this pandemic. Still, delivering your food, your essentials, despite extreme weather conditions. It is time for the city to recognize us as essential with actions, not with words. This package of legislation is the first step to guarantee the respect that we deserve and also ensure that there is more transparency in the payment of our tips. Personally, I have seen these irregularities of these apps. It is frustrating to see how these apps are, are disappearing our tips and for the restaurant and for the restaurant systems to show us something different than the apps. It is hard to see that the customer's gratuity doesn't get to, into our account. Many of my coworkers don't have the courage to report this irregularity because of the fear they have when it comes to confronting these companies. But here we are on behalf of them, making visible our reality with these apps. This, the summer is, this summer season is, is very hard for, to, for food delivery workers who struggle and we barely make enough to cover our daily expenses. I have actually made little as $30, 30 a day working from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. These apps manipulate the algorithm to their benefit without any consideration or concerns about our reality and working conditions. At the end of the day, we are disposable labor. When they, look, when they no longer need us, they deactivate us without reason, without any kind of explanation. For this reason, we're organizing as the Delivery Workers United and won't be silent anymore. Today, you have the opportunity to um, listen to, to us, the essential workers, with actions, not with words. We look forward in passing this legislation that will continue to provide protections to the essential workers of New York City. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we have Ligia Hualpa, uh, Teodora Flores, and then Saru Jayaraman. Ligia? Uh, um, yeah, here I am. Sorry, technology translation. <laughs> um, so my name is Ligia Walpa. I am the executive director of the Workers' Justice Project, a workers' rights organization that represents New York City food delivery workers, house cleaners, the laborers, and essential workers who are, placed, who are playing a irreplaceable role in our city's recovery. Since last year, Workers' Justice Project has been responding to the most basic human needs of app-based food delivery workers who were left to survive without economic relief, without unemployment insurance, without health insurance, without paid sick time leave, without workers' comp, and most importantly, without essential workers' rights protections. We have been witnessing how New York City's most essential workers are dehumanized and treated as disposable labor. As delivery workers were invisibilized by this pandemic, WJP has been lifting up their dignity by helping them band together as Los Deliveristas Unidos, or the Delivery Workers United. For more than a year, New York, New Yorkers, including yourselves, have been relying on apps like DoorDash, Grubhub, Uber Eats, and others to transport your food, your medicine, your groceries, and other essentials. But what these apps have failed to tell you is that their delivery drivers are not paid a living wage, are, are told not to ask for a restroom when they pick up your food, and are working in constant fear of being deactivated or terminated for demanding better working conditions. These tech companies are making billions in pandemic profits by stealing the tips of delivery workers and charging high percentage fees from your le local restaurants and for consumers like yourself. The truth is that delivery workers are barely, are barely able to feed their own families, pay their rent by mostly relying on tips as a form of wage. As delivery apps keep expanding their market to deliver groceries, medicine, and other essentials. Workers are becoming victims of ruthless exploitation that puts their lives at risk. 
with no guarantee of payment in case of death or serious injury or no protection against unsafe working conditions. When a delivery worker gets injured or dies while on duty with their house, um, most of these workers have to pay for all their medical costs. I'm just going to end like this. There has been 11 workers, invisible heroes, who were killed this past year while delivering the food for New York food delivery for New Yorkers. And I, it is important not, it is important to mention their names. And I'm going to briefly just mention because their names cannot be invisibilized. Juan Cruz, Victorio Gilaro Guzman, Adrián Coyot, Juan Luz, 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 Lizu Cuargo, Alejandro Santos Escamilla, Maiko Basurto Larino, Esther Ernesto Isidoro Guzmán, Martín Morán, Francisco Villalba, Reinaldo Rodríguez, Luis Alvarado. These are just some of the voices that were invisibilized by the apps who continuously exploit and put at risk the livelihood of New Yorkers who live and work in our city as essential workers. Now, would you listen to them? Will you honor and protect them by passing this six landmark proposals that will set the example for the rest of the country? We look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you, Ligia. Next, we have Teodora Flores, Saru Jayaraman, and then Candace Tolliver. Teodora? The time will begin. Hello. <clears throat> My name is Carlos Hernandez, and I currently work at Chick fil A, and I have been in the fast food industry for the past two years. I'm here today to offer my support and solidarity to the, to the deliverista workers in their fight for dignity before the city council. Fast food workers like myself share many of the same struggles with delivery workers. We are united in our fights for worker rights. At my store, I see how stressed out delivery workers are when they come to pick up orders, and I see how hard their job is. Like them, I am also a frontline worker during the pandemic. Like theirs, my job as a fast food worker is very taxing and physical. For instance, my feet and my back often hurt after a long week. And just like delivery drivers here today, fast food workers have been fighting throughout the pandemic in the hope that we can change our lives and our jobs for the better. Over the last year, fast food workers has organized at restaurants throughout the city and testified before this very council. And it paid off. This past December, the council voted to pass groundbreaking just cause legislation that provides me and my coworkers with protections on a job that we never had before. Now, all of a sudden, we no longer have to fear being fired without a reason. Now we have rights. Fast food and delivery are two sides of the same coin. Together, we have braved the worst days of the pandemic, setting aside our own safety to feed all types of New Yorkers. I am grateful to the council for the solitary we, you have shown to the fast food workers of the New York City. Today, here, delivery drivers near the same solitary. Because when you get down to it, their demand is ultimately the same as ours. Dignity and justice for the essential workers who kept the city going through the worst pandemic we ever seen. Thank you and God bless. Thank you, Carlos. Next up, we have Saru Jayaraman, uh, Candace Tolliver, and then Russell Jackson. Saru? Your time will begin. Hi, everybody, and thank you so much, uh, Chair Ayala, Council Member uh, Reynoso, the champion of our bill, Council Member Lander, who's the champion of all workers all the time, and all of you who are uh, fighting so hard for so many different workers. I want to definitely first start by saying we stand in solidarity with the deliveristas and their struggles today. Kudos to them for their courage. I'm here to speak today on intro 2163 about tipped workers. Uh, first to say who tipped workers are because I think quite often the Restaurant Association confuses us. Uh, over two thirds of tipped workers in New York are women. Over 75% are immigrants. They are overwhelmingly people of color, mostly women of color working in very casual restaurants, IHOPs, Denny's, mom and pop diners across New York City. They mostly do not work in fine dining. And even prior to the pandemic, this sub minimum wage, which is a direct legacy of slavery, a way for the industry to hire black people at emancipation and not pay them anything has been a source of incredible poverty and sexual harassment 
for a mostly female workforce that has to tolerate inappropriate customer behavior to get tips, to make up their base wage, to clarify, to answer the question that was asked earlier. I don't think it was clearly answered. Tip workers get a sub minimum wage of $10 in New York and tips are supposed to bring them to the full minimum wage, but often don't. In fact, the Obama administration reported an 84% violation with regard to tips bringing people to the full minimum wage. Now, during the pandemic, the situation got so much worse. Reporter, workers reported that tips went down 50 to 75% and health risks, hostility and harassment went way up with hundreds of New York women reporting that they were asked repeatedly by male customers to take off their masks so men could judge their looks and their tips on that basis, a life-threatening situation and frankly disgusting. Well-intentioned, the surcharge bill that the city passed to support struggling restaurants has hurt these workers. We surveyed several hundred earlier this year, 33% of New York City rep workers report that their restaurant employers using the surcharge and 60% of those workers say their tips have been cut in half by the surcharge. This bill would solve that problem by requiring employers, providing them more than enough to cover the wage increase and requiring employers to pay these workers a full minimum wage like every other worker in every other industry. And by the way, that is what workers are calling for before they come back to work. We surveyed 3000 workers, 53% say they're leaving the restaurant industry, 78% say the only thing that will make them come back is a full livable wage with tips on top. And so it has to be understood this bill is not just important to protect workers who got hurt by a surcharge bill that the council passed, it's also essential to allow the New York City restaurant industry to reopen. The speakers lawyers have said that it's legal. The city, city hall lawyers have said that it's legal. In fact, the mayor ran a similar program already that was declared legal. There is no legality issue here. There's an inertia issue here. And the inertia has led to workers who you all care about, I know, being hurt by a well-intentioned bill that has cut their tips in half. Every day that goes by, their tips get cut by this surcharge, and we need you please to rectify it through intro 2163. Biden has made ending the subminimum wage a top priority. New York City can lead, New York City Council can lead by first saying, if you're gonna have the privilege of adding a surcharge, you must have the requirement to protect workers, paying them a full livable wage with tips on top. Thank you. I see Councilmember Lander has his hand raised. Councilmember Lander. Thank you. Just a very quick question, Sarah. Thanks for, for being here. Are there other cities uh, that have taken some actions? You know, obviously we want the state to move forward uh, to one fair wage, but, you know, and we'll all keep pushing for that together. But in the interim, I like this idea of us taking a step here and I praise Councilmember Reynoso for his bill. Are there other cities that have similarly taken some kind of action in the absence of state action to push forward? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, first of all, cities that are able to go to one fair wage, some have done it. Flagstaff, Arizona moved to one fair wage. Uh, but in during the pandemic, multiple cities created programs to provide restaurant owners with privileges or benefits if they move to a full minimum wage with tips on top. Chicago provided a big program called High Road Kitchens where they provided cash grants to restaurants, some form of revenue if they transitioned to a full minimum wage. Detroit did the same exact thing. Uh, Boston, we worked with Mayor Walsh, who's now become Secretary of Labor to institute a similar program. He used stimulus funding to provide cash grants to restaurants if they commit to moving to one fair wage. As you all know, New York City worked with us to do the same thing. And this would be an extension of that program, which is to say, Restaurants are right now voluntarily moving to one fair wage because they have to, to get workers to come back to work. There's a massive shortage. We're not calling it worker shortage. It's a wage shortage. It's workers saying we won't go back without full minimum wages. So New York City realized that and has been rewarding restaurants for moving in this direction. This surcharge bill wouldn't be an extension of that. Let's reward restaurants that are willing to move already voluntarily in this direction by allowing them to have some additional revenue through the surcharge. And let's ensure that the surcharge that already exists, a COVID surcharge has protections built into it because right now employers can use that surcharge for anything. As council member Reynoso said, there was a lot of concern. You rightfully wanted to help restaurants. You've got to ensure workers are protected and help workers as well. Thank you. Thank you, Saru. 
Next, we have Candace Tolliver, followed by Russell Jackson and then Jessica Wong. Candace? Your time will begin. Hi, good afternoon. Um, good afternoon, Chair Ayala and members of the committee. My name is Candace Tolliver, and I'm the vice president of SEIU Local 30 CBJ. 30 CBJ is the largest building service union in the country with over, over 85,000 of our members living in New York City metro area. 30 CBJ supports intro 2288, 2289, 2294, 2296, and intro 2298. These bills provide needed and overdue reforms that will improve the working conditions of one of our most important yet vulnerable workforces. These bills would ensure that one, the cost of insulated food delivery bags are not passed on to the workers. Uh, two, give workers control over the maximum distance they will travel in a work time. Uh, three, establish a method for determining minimum pay. And four, provide bathroom access. Sorry, and number five, prevent fees from being charged to workers for receiving their pay. Food delivery workers have played a crucial role in the pandemic. Um, while many of us were sheltering in place, these workers were venturing out into the restaurants and into our apartment buildings, putting their lives at risk to keep us fed. Food delivery workers also played a crucial role and keeping restaurants open, thus saving many small businesses and restaurant jobs. These are basic human rights that all workers des deserve. Despite these important roles, food delivery workers find themselves without many of the protections that most workers take for granted, such as being, being protected by a legal floor on compensation and even having access to a bathroom. Food delivery workers, our workforce composed of mostly people of color and immigrants. Thus, it is not surprising that just like other similar, similarly situated workers, farm workers and domestic workers, sorry, I was getting a call while I'm talking, um, farm workers and domestic workers, they have been treated as less than by I'm our so Were you talking to me? I'm sorry, I heard a voice. Okay, you can finish. Keep going, okay. However, today the council has an opportunity to recognize these workers uh, that these workers are essential workers and are deserving of protection of the law. 32PJ looks forward to working with the workers, advocates, stakeholders, and the council on finalizing these important policies. I particularly want to emphasize how important it is for the city to give itself the power to collect and analyze data as it seeks to formulate protections for delivery and other gig workers. Lastly, I want to thank Los Deliveristas, Unidos, and the Workers' Justice project for their effort to improve working condition for food delivery workers. Thank you. Thank you, Candace. Next up, we have Russell Jackson, followed by Jessica Wong, and then Andrew Ritchie. Russell? Good time, we'll begin. Hi, yes, uh, my name is Russell Jackson. I am the chef owner of uh, Reverence in Harlem. Um, New York needs restaurants. And restaurants need customers, but without the staff, all the customers in the world won't matter. 50% uh, of workers say that they're leaving the industry because they view jobs as exploitive and a two-tiered two wage system perpetrates that. Uh, lots of restaurant owners, they want to do the right thing like we do and pay good wages. But low road employers are short-sighted don't have a full understanding of the long-term aspect of what they're, what they're doing to the industry. They continue to leverage uh, the poverty level wages to drive down uh, the understanding and true cost of food and hospitality in the minds of the consumers, putting high road employers at a competitive disadvantage. This surcharge, and support of this surcharge sends several signals. To the workers, it sends it sends information that the employers are committed to fair wage practices and that these are good jobs. To the consumers, it allows them to understand that their charges are going to higher wages and investment in improved working conditions for all of their staff. To Albany and, and where they have failed to the support the restaurant workers, the city needs to lead the way. And I've been fighting for this well over since 2009, my time in San Francisco and now in here in New York, 
it's imperative that the city takes the initiative to be the first in on this. We can lead the way in the right way and make sure that the rest of the country is following us. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. Next, we have Jessica Wong, followed by Andrew Ridgey and then Kathleen Riley. Jessica? If time will begin. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Jessica Wong and I'm a service industry professional. Um, I worked with uh, Best in New York Karaoke uh, Bar and Lounge. Um, today, I'm speaking in support of intro 2163, sponsored by council member Ray Noso, which would allow restaurants to permanently add a surcharge if they pay their tip workers a full minimum wage with tips on top. The federal government and New York State have offered up billions in restaurant relief to restaurant owners, but restaurants cannot recover without real relief for the workforce. We rely on the restaurant industry to help New York State's economy, and the restaurant industry depends on its workers. New York City can take the first step towards raising the wages for tip workers to the full minimum wage with tips on top as an urgent matter to let New York, uh, New York's restaurant industry fully reopen and recover. While well-intentioned, the temporary COVID surcharge policy allowing restaurants to add a surcharge of up to 10% confused co consumers who believed that the surcharge was going to workers when in fact it was going to employers. If they were planning to tip 20%, the 10% surcharge resulted in them tipping an additional 10%. Intro 2163 would fix this allowing New York City restaurant owners to permanently add a surcharge of up to 15% as long as they pay their tip employees a full minimum wage with tips on top instead of the sub-minimum wage. Paying workers a full minimum wage would guarantee a stable base wage regardless of customer reactions to the surcharge. It would also reward restaurants willing to pay the full minimum wage by allowing them to bring in an increased revenue during the pandemic. The subminimum wage was always unjust, but the pandemic made our bad situation worse. Tips went down and health risks and harassment went up. Restaurants aren't facing a worker. The time shortage. has expired. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jessica. Next, we have Andrew Ridgey, followed by Kathleen Riley and then Mikey Nav. Andrew? Your time will begin now. Good afternoon. My name is Andrew Ridgey. I am the executive director of the New York City Hospitality Alliance. We are a not-for-profit trade association that represents restaurants and nightlife venues in the five boroughs. Today, I'm going to testify on 2311, 2298, and 2163. On 2311, we strongly support this bill that would require third-party delivery companies provide customer data to restaurants. Uh, this would allow restaurants to basically even the playing field, being able to reach out to their customers, to market to them, and really own that delivery uh, customer who is their customer. Currently, by withholding the data, the third-party delivery companies have enormous leverage over restaurants because restaurants can't leave the platform because then essentially they leave their customers and then the third-party platform will use that customer data to market to competitor restaurants. So we strongly support this. This is an urgent bill. We would just ask that it be slightly amended to also require third-party reservation companies to provide customer data to those restaurants uh, because it's a similar dynamic there and we wanna commend council member powers on that bill. Uh, the second bill is related to restaurants being required to provide toilet facility access. Uh, Obviously, our delivery workers have been essential heroes throughout the pandemic, and it is a common courtesy to provide access to their restroom. We surveyed a couple hundred restaurants. The vast majority of them already did provide access, but we do understand by speaking with delivery workers and their representatives that that is not always the case. So while we wish the city had a robust public restroom uh, network, that is not the case, and we support this legislation. We would just ask for two updates to be made. 
One, we'd like to ensure that any first time violation would provide a cure period or a warning before a fine is levied. And the second is we want to ensure that restaurants within reason have the ability to set up a uh, policy to allow third party delivery workers to use their restrooms. And then finally, if I may, real quickly on the last bill, Chair, may I? Yes, thank you so much. Um, and then on the COVID surcharge, I, I don't have time obviously to go over many of the comments uh, that were made earlier. I commend Chef um, Russell on uh, his comments. He obviously should run his business how he sees fit and being an advocate out there uh, is something that's really important. However, the 15% surcharge does not work for the vast majority of restaurants from an operational or a financial perspective. Restaurants that wanna do surcharges usually fall into two camps. One, a single digit surcharge, the money goes to gross receipts of the business, they continue to take the tip credit and that surcharge is used to offset different expenses, which includes wages. The second camp tends to be someone that wants to do an 18 to say 25% surcharge, in which case customers usually would not leave a tip and they would pay a straight hourly wage. In some cases, maybe customers would continue to tip. In that case, the tips wouldn't be enough to cover the uh, tip wage compared to the full minimum wage. So the restaurants would not be taking the tip credit from a practical standpoint. But 15% does not do enough. Losing the tip credit equals a 50% increase in labor costs for tipped workers. Plus, there are additional expenses associated with not taking the tip credit, which will make it even more devastating for restaurants that are shuttering and really teetering on the edge of survival, particularly when the law does require all tipped employees to receive at least $15 an hour, but in most cases, they are earning much, much more. And in fact, Throughout the state and just here in New York, the reason the tip credit is in place in many reasons is because a worker led movement to keep the tip credit in effect. But at 15%, it doesn't do much because if a restaurant does a 15% surcharge and doesn't take the tip credit, it's not enough to really offset their expenses. And for a consumer, if they see a 15% surcharge, they will probably end up tipping less. And at the outcome, you could see tip workers even making less money as a result. So we'd say drop this bill or amend it to allow restaurants to do a smaller surcharge where they would still be required to pay $15 an hour minimum wage, but the, the workers can earn more or do a larger surcharge of 15%, say 18 to 25%, in which case restaurants would not take the tip credit. I think that's a much better balance. Uh, it's workable because as is, I've spoken with so many restaurants and at 15%, it's just not going to be something that they are going to use. So I'll leave it at that. I'm happy to answer any questions and speak further about these bills. But again, we strongly support third-party delivery services providing customer data to restaurants. We support uh, requiring restaurants to provide toilet facility access to food delivery workers, presuming those two amendments are made. And we strongly oppose uh, repealing the COVID surcharge and implementing a new 15% surcharge unless it's modified to provide more flexibility so different work types of restaurants can implement the surcharge in a way that works for their business. I want to thank you, Chair. Thank you, members, for your consideration. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Andrew. Next up, we have Kathleen Riley, followed by Mikey Nab, and then Maria Figueroa. Kathleen? Good time. We'll begin now. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kathleen Riley with the New York State Restaurant Association, and we'd like to use our time today to discuss um, the intro regarding data sharing. Uh, other comments we'll make in writing after the fact, but there's a lot on the table today. Um, the pandemic has exacerbated so many dynamics in our industry, but in particular, re restaurants' relationships with food delivery platforms have grown all the more important over the last 16 months. When our city eateries were closed for on-premise dining, then limited to outdoor dining, and strictly capacity restricted for indoor dining, restaurants relied upon takeout and delivery orders to keep any amount of cash flow coming in. 
Takeout and delivery sales could not make up for the losses sustained from pandemic limitations though. In a survey we conducted in partnership with the National Restaurant Association earlier this year, we found that increased takeout and delivery orders made up for under 30% of lost on-premise business for most restaurant operators. Yet restaurants were still forced to rely on takeout and delivery in order for their businesses to survive until the reopening. And in many cases that placed restaurant operators in a difficult, can't live with it, can't live without it position towards the food delivery platforms. Thankfully, the city council took the responsible step last spring to set some boundaries on the fee structures these delivery platforms were charging restaurants, correctly noting that restaurant operators were effectively hamstrung between pandemic restrictions coupled with exploitative fees from these platforms. With fee caps in place, one facet of the relationship was put in check. However, in regards to customer data for third-party food delivery orders, there's still an exploitative dynamic in play. We are so appreciative to council member powers and the co-sponsors for bringing intro 2311 forward today and recognizing that this dynamic needs to change. As things currently stand, third party, the food delivery platforms control the customer data for orders that they facilitate, which may sound simple enough, but what it means is that restaurants are kept at arm's length from their customers, even repeat customers, even regulars, because platforms do not share critical information like phone number, order history, email address with the restaurant operators and allow them to maintain it. Restaurants work hard to cultivate lasting relationships with their customers and their community. They need to be able to reach out directly to their customers, whether to give an update on an order or offer a promotion. It's restaurants and their quality food and beverage that keep customers coming back to delivery platforms, but then it's only the platforms who are able to form relationships with diners and that's not right. The New York State Restaurant Association supports the solution offered in intro 2311, which would give restaurant operators access to the customer data about their own customers and stop the gatekeeping by third party platforms. It's a reform that our members have been asking for, and we believe it's an important step in leveling the playing field for restaurant operators. Restaurants. Thank you. For restaurants operating in a market heavily influenced by these delivery platforms. Um, I also think that what Andrew pointed out around uh, reservation making platforms is a great point, and I think that they do play a similar kind of role in keeping uh, consumer data from the restaurants themselves. Thank you for your time this afternoon and we will follow up in writing. Thank you, Kathleen. Next up, we have Mikey Nab, followed by Maria Figueroa and then James Parrott. Mikey? Your time will begin now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Sorry. Hi, my name is Mikey Nab. I'm the co-director of Raise High Road Restaurants, which is a national network of over a thousand restaurant owners across the country, including over a hundred in New York who have made commitments to high road employment practices like increasing wages and improving working conditions. Chef Russell, who spoke earlier, is one of our members. Uh, and my members have asked me to come and speak on behalf of the robust industry in New York of, of restaurants and hospitality professionals that makes New York, New York dynamic and unique in the sense that it contributes so much to the economy. If restaurant workers leave the industry and or the city at the rates that they're saying they, they're considering doing it, it will never recover. And the, the restaurant landscape in the future of New York will be bleak. The restaurants that fund the National Restaurant Association are mostly massive multinational publicly traded corporations that we would consider low road employers that have been fighting to suppress wages and subjugate our workforce for decades, almost over a hundred years. If that continues to happen, workers will never come back. Uh, and they'll see the jobs as exploitative as Russell mentioned. We need to send a signal to the entire workforce that New York is a magical place for restaurants, that these are good jobs, that we do treat them with dignity and respect. And this surcharge allows restaurants to opt in. It's not required. If restaurants don't want to charge a 15% surcharge and pay one fair wage, they don't need to. But if they can figure out how to run their business the way they want to, as Andrew Ridgey said Russell should do, then they can opt into it. Uh, we, we believe that this would send a signal to the workforce that we're trying our best as an industry to make these jobs professional and treat them with dignity. And also send a message to Albany that you can't just save restaurant owners, you need to save restaurant workers or else the owners have no way to prepare and distribute the food and offer great service and hospitality to our guests. So I strongly urge you to support the, this, this measure and I, and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mikey. Next, we have Maria Figueroa, James, followed by James Parrott and then Sarah Brockman. 
Maria? Your time will begin now. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Maria Figueroa. I'm Director of Labor and Policy Research at the Worker Institute of Cornell University. Thank you for the opportunity to deliver this testimony, which draws on field research we conducted in partnership with Worker Justice Project. We surveyed more than 500 workers, uh, app-based uh, food delivery workers from all five boroughs and all demographic groups that this diverse workforce comprises. Our findings revealed a range of pressing issues, including low earnings, lack of transparency in payment and evaluation systems, lack of access to bathrooms, uh, and, and very serious uh, safety hazards, such as exposure to violent crime related to the e-bike uh, theft, uh, and risk of accidents on the road, which workers face without any type of compensation for healthcare expenses and lost work time. Our survey data revealed that the base, uh, the base pay of app-based delivery workers is between $6.57, six about $7, and about $8 per hour. This excludes tips and, other, and operating expenses such as uh, uh, sale and internet ser uh, service, vehicle maintenance, and other expenses. In order for workers to achieve this low level of pay, which is well below minimum uh, legal minimum wages in the city, they have to work long hours and for multiple apps, since each individual app does not generate enough work. About two thirds of survey respondents are, re are reported that they regularly work at least six days per week. And 85% said that this was their main and only job. Uh, additionally, about 40% of all survey respondents uh, reported experiencing issues related to payments from Your the time has expired including non-payment and under underpayment of tips, receiving lower pay than indicated on the apps, late payments, or non-payment of earnings from an entire work week. Um, we strongly support 2294 and 2296 to increase the base pay that workers receive and regulate this, the payment system. And we call for new regulation that would require the apps to share their data with a city agency, such as the DCWP, which would be given an authority similar to the TLCs in collecting data from the rideshare uh, platforms. Thank you. Uh, yeah, can I interject a second? Uh, quería decir que tenemos servicio de, tradu de traducción solamente hasta las cuatro. Si hay una persona que necesite ese servicio, si por favor podrían alzar la mano en la función que dice, donde dice participantes, hay una, una parte donde puede uh, subir la mano para nosotros por lo menos llamarlos primero. Ok, I, I see. So we only have uh, translation services available through four. So we're asking members um, that are here to testify um, who need the service to please raise their hand so that we can call on them first. I see quite a few, Stephanie. Yeah, I see. Yep, I see about three. Um, OK, so why don't we start with Pepe Johnson? I see your hand is raised. Pepe, podemos empezar contigo. Time will begin. Señor Pepe, si me permite, me das una oración, después me, me permite traducir, después me das la próxima oración y seguimos así. Adelante. Es que no lo... ¿Me oyes? Sí, ahora le oigo. Pues, eh, estás bastante bajita, tienes que hablar con bastante volumen, por favor. Okay. Bueno, no me Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Adelante. ¿Está 
Universidad Africana. Eh, quería dar mi testimonio para el delivery. No la puedo oír, perdón. Permíteme, no, no la puedo oír. Está muy bajo el volumen. Oh, ok, un I'm sorry, it's very hard to hear her. Volume is very low. ¿Ahora me oye? Un poco, pero ahora tienes un, un eco. Regresamos a donde usted, Pepe, entre unos minutos. Ok, so let's move on to César Marín. César Marín. Me permite una oración, la traduzco okay. y después la próxima oración. Adelante, César. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es César Merino. Soy repartidor de comida y trabajo para Relay. Llevo haciendo este trabajo por dos años. Hace dos meses sufrí un asalto en, haciendo una entrega de comida. Permíteme, por favor, señor Marino. Hello, my name is Cesar Marino. I'm a food distributor. I work for Rely. As of two months ago, I suffered an assault while I was doing a delivery. Adelante, señor Marino. Gracias. Me, me dura do, uh, para la aplicación. No me dan horas durante el día. Por eso debo tomar horas por la noche. Y tengo que ir a dejar las órdenes a larga distancia y lugares donde es muy peligroso porque la compañía no me muestra a qué distancia está el cliente sino hasta que yo recibo la comida del restaurante así me y si me niego a ir a esos lugares donde arriesgo mi vida el, al siguiente día me castiga la, la compañía y no me deja trabajar o me bloquea las horas no Permíteme. So the application, I have no hours during the day. I need hours during the night. And then because there's these long distances, they send me to do these deliveries of very far places, very dangerous places. And then the company does not let me know where it is located until I've received the food. And then if I don't deliver it at that point, they deny me. Or if, if I deny delivering to these risky places where I risk my life, the company then punishes me by blocking my hours or not giving me any work. Adelante. Uh, tengo que ir si la aplicación me deja entrar a trabajar al menos una hora o, o dos horas al día recorro todo el día tratando de entrar a la aplicación y no y no me deja I uh, try to go into the application and it doesn't let me I try to go into one or two or two hours and I try but the application does not let me in adelante la aplicación nos amenaza constantemente que nos va a bloquear si nuestra nuestra cuenta y, nos, y no nos da oportunidad ni de tan siquiera hablar con alguien de la compañía. No tiene ni, ningún número de teléfono para comunicarnos con ellos. Así que nosotros para, est, para esta compañía somos invisibles. Permíteme. So the application like threatens us. It threatens to block our account. And it never gives us any chance to call anyone to debate the issue. There's no number to communicate or anything. Basically all its workers are invisible. Adelante. Señores concejales, pedimos que por favor pasen estas leyes por el bien de nosotros los trabajadores. Gracias. Council people, I ask us, I ask you all to please pass, approve this law because it would help us all. Thank you. Thank you. Next we'll call on Gustavo Mancia. Gustavo Mancia. Your time will begin. Me permites una oración, después puedo traducir y después sigues con la próxima oración en pedacitos. Adelante, por favor. Hola, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Gustavo Mancilla. Soy deliverista y trabajo para las aplicaciones de reparto de comida. Well, good afternoon. My name is Gustavo Mancilla. I work as a food distributor and I work for the food distribution apps. Adelante. Vivo en Manhattan y trabajo por toda la ciudad haciendo deliveries. I live in Manhattan. I work throughout all the whole city making deliveries. Adelante. 
soy uno de los muchos trabajadores que sufre del abuso por parte de estas compañías. Estas Además, compañías no son transparentes en cuanto al pago a las propinas. Permíteme, I'm one of many who suffer the abuse given out by these companies. They're not transparent with the amount of tips that we earn. Adelante. Por ejemplo, hace unas semanas un cliente ordenó su comida en cierto restaurante. Cuando le entregué la comida, él me preguntó si yo había recibido la propina. For example, about a week ago, I was delivering food to a client from one of these restaurants. And after the delivery, the client asked me if I had received the tips. Adelante. Inmediatamente, yo revisé mi aplicación y aparecía cero. I immediately reviewed the application and zero is what appeared. Adelante. El cliente me mostró su recibo y él había pagado 9.60 de propina, lo cual a mí la aplicación me pagó cero. The client then showed me his receipt, his receipts, which showed he gave a $9.60 tip, although my app was showing zero. Adelante. Cuando yo reclamé por el robo de las propinas, la aplicación culpa a los restaurantes y no quieren darnos ninguna explicación. When I made a claim about this thievery of tips, the app gave the blame to the restaurant. Adelante. Constantemente aplicaciones como Relay nos envían mensajes amenazándonos que no debemos preguntarle al cliente acerca de la propina. Constantly, the applications like Relay sends us messages threatening us to say not to ask the clients or the customers any information. Adelante. Que, que, si, la, que si lo hacemos, nos van a bloquear la cuenta. And if we do it, They will block our account. Adelante. Otra forma que estas aplicaciones nos roban los tips es cuando redondean Time los monos. Another way that they rob our tips is when you round off. Se ha vencido el tiempo. Thank you. Next, we'll call on Roberto Corales, please. Your time will begin now. Roberto Corales, me permites una oración, así puedo traducir y después seguimos adelante con la próxima oración. Adelante. Hola, mi nombre es Roberto Corrales. My name is Roberto Corrales. Adelante. Necesitamos que no nos dejen en el abandono cuando tenemos un accidente. We need you not to abandon us when we have an accident. Adelante. Porque ellos no se quieren ser responsables cuando nos roban las bicicletas de trabajo. Because they don't want to be responsible when they rob our bikes from work. Adelante. Nos matan en las calles y también nos roban las propinas. They kill us on the streets as well as rob us of our tips. Adelante. Queremos que las aplicaciones sean transparentes, tanto los restaurantes también. We want the apps to be transparent as well as the restaurants. Adelante. Porque ellos también tienen que ver sobre las, el robo de propinas. Because they also have to do with the thieving, the robbing of tips. Adelante. También queremos que pase esta ley para que nos paguen el salario mínimo. Por lo que we'll, también este es un trabajo de verdad. We also want this law to pass so we can get paid minimum wage because this is a real job. Y por otro lado, que no haya discriminación porque a veces nosotros pasamos frío y no nos dejan entrar en los restaurantes. And on the other hand, there's also the discrimination, because then we show up and sometimes they don't even want to let us into the restaurants. Adelante. Y nosotros estamos afuera soportando altas temperaturas tanto bajas. Y and somos también parte del sistema de trabajo. We, and we're outside dealing with all kind of temperatures, hot and cold temperatures. We are part of this system. Ya, yeah. también las aplicaciones necesitamos que no nos manden más de tres o cinco millas, especialmente cuando el clima no está favorable. And as far as the apps, we need not to be sent further than two to three miles away from the destination, especially when the climate is 
to take into account? Porque para manejar es muy dificultoso. También he visto muchos accidentes, incluso me pasó a mí también. And managing the distances, like driving around, it's not very easy. And I've had, I've seen many accidents occurred. I too was involved in an accident. Adelante. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you todos. very much. Gracias. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll call on Juan Carlos Huerta, followed by Oscar Gonzalez. Señor Huerta, me permites una oración, Tradu puedo traducir y después la próxima oración y seguimos así. Adelante. Permítame un segundo, por favor. Give me one second, please. Tengo que poner mi cámara. Do I have to put on my camera? Adelante, okay. señor. Ok. Um, permítame un segundo. Ok, no. Um, hi, how are you? My name is um, Juan Carlos. I work as, uh, as a chef at a top restaurant, as well as a consultant for restaurants in several states. Due to COVID, I'm now a food delivery worker. I work as a top dasher at, at DoorDash. I also work for Relay originally when I seen the advertisements for these companies. I thought this line of work will be excellent for my financial and well-being. For the time being, however, several issues holds in these companies begin to uh, unveil. And I had no idea how to use the app. And there, was, and there wasn't a service to show, to show me how. So I was unable to work efficiently for all, or at all times. For example, my first day of working for DoorDash was very difficult. Since I didn't know how to use the app, I had no idea that it was accepting an order from my hand to Brooklyn and 40, 40 degrees weather near freezing temperature, snow on the ground, and it was raining. After my initial delivery, I went home with my clothes soaked, took a hot shower, and helps to warming up my body and face. Felt like a needles because of the, of, of the wind. That was on February 2021. Was the eighth of uh, the snowiest February in the history of New York. I was phys physically able to perform any more uh, deliveries that day, and I only made sixteen dollars, and I got a little sick. In order to be a top dasher, you have to have near a perfect rating from customers and accept all, uh, most of the orders, regardless of the distance. If you're not a top dasher, you cannot simply log in and in or out anytime to work. You are required to serve your hours in advance the of the doing so. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we will be calling on Oscar Gonzalez, followed by Pedro Castillo. Señor González, me das una oración, así la puedo traducir y después seguimos a la próxima oración. Adelante. ¿Me escuchan? Sí, lo oigo. Estamos bien. Okay. Uh, yo no necesito traducción, pero gracias. Okay. No need for translation. Ok, so my name is Oscar González. I work for Uber Eats, um, DoorDash, and GrabHub. So I have three topics. First one is the activations. They deactivate you without any warning and without you being able to defend yourself against the accusation that was why you got deactivated. And when you call regarding that deactivation, all you get is poor support and they never solve your problems and just give you lame answers and go over the same thing over and over until you get tired of it and stop dealing with them. And when you appeal, if you do, they always deny it. So how is that? Um, in conclusion, it is not fair. Second topic is help. Uh, sometimes when you call, you have to wait 10 plus minutes to get support when 
uh, to answer the call. Meanwhile, the customers are waiting for the food, which makes them mad, obviously, and less likely to order again through that app, which makes us all less money because they're ordering somewhere else or directly through the restaurant delivery service if they have. Um, when you need help with anything associated with your account, except for example, you need to update your vehicle, vehicle mode, your name or your picture, you can't except with Grubhub, they let you change your picture. Uh, and they tell you that they don't know how to solve um, your concern or what is the process to solve it. And if they don't know, who knows? Um, and the third topic and last one is promotions. They offer you X amount of money if you complete a certain amount of deliveries or complete them in a certain amount of time. Just to tell you after that. Your that time has expired that you didn't complete all the deliveries or didn't do it in time. And when you call to solve it, they just transfer it to another department that deals with that, from which you never ever get any type of answers, either good or bad. Doesn't matter if you provide any proof or not. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. We'd like to announce also that you may submit your written testimony at the email address testimony at council.nyc.gov. También queremos indicar que pueden dar su testimonio en el escrito, solo escribiéndolo, redactándolo y enviándolo al correo electrónico testimony arroba council punto punto gov. Thank you. Now we'll continue with Pedro Castillo, followed by Juan Reynoso. Pedro Castillo, si hablas español, me das una oración, me permites traducir y seguimos adelante. Adelante. Good time will begin. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Adelante. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Pedro Castillo, vivo en Queens, tengo dos hijos, trabajo en Dordas y en Relay. Uh, my name is Pedro Castillo, I have two kids, I live in Queens, I work with Relay and another app. Adelante. Al trabajar haciendo el delivery para cualquiera de estas aplicaciones, siento que me estoy volviendo muy riesgoso ante mi familia, trabajos. Doing delivery work using these apps, I feel like I'm putting myself at risk for, and, and too much risk for my family. Adelante. Estas aplicaciones ignoran cualquier situación que nos puedan pasar y nos presionan demasiado. These applications ignore any situation that could happen to us and they pressure us constantly. Adelante. Para que entregar las órdenes a distancias lejos y no nos den la, los riesgos. They have us deliver at distances that are very far and they do not see the risks. Adelante. Hace tres semanas tuve un accidente. Un carro me impactó y fue muy grande. Me partí la cabeza y la clavícula. Mi bicicleta se destrozó. About three weeks ago, I had an accident. I was hit by a car. It was really big. It opened up my head, broke my cl clavicle, and my bike was destroyed. Adelante. Gracias a Dios, estoy vivo. Thank God I'm alive. Adelante. No sé cuánto tiempo pueda seguir en recuperación, pero estoy muy preocupado. No sé cómo pagar mi renta. No sé cómo dar comida a mi familia estoy paralizado no no voy a pagar no tengo cómo pagar los bills del hospital no cuento con un seguro time is expired se venció el tiempo i don't know how much time i can continue with my recuperation i am very worried i don't have anything to pay my rent feed my family i'm paralyzed 
I have no way to earn a living. Estas aplicaciones deberían ser más conscientes de sus trabajadores, apoyarnos. These applications should be more conscious of their workers and help with helping us. Necesitamos que esas compañías paguen un salario mínimo y nos brinden una protección. Es necesario que estas leyes pasen para que nos podamos sentir confiados y poder salir a trabajar. We need these companies to pay a minimum wage and to give us some kind of protection. These laws need to pass so that we can feel that we can trust working with them. Y que se vuelvan responsables de nosotros y poder trabajar con dignidad y respeto. Muchas gracias. And then become respons responsible for us so that we can work with dignity and respect. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'd like to call next Juan Reynoso and, and followed by Isabel Navarro. Gracias. Señor Reynoso, me permites una oración. Le puedo traducir y después seguimos con la próxima oración. Adelante. Good time, we'll begin. Eh, sí, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Juan Reynoso. Soy de Guatemala y vivo en el Bronx. Good afternoon. My name is Juan Reynoso. I come from Guatemala and I live in the Bronx. Adelante, Reynoso. Llevo trabajando dos años en la aplicación de DoorDash y GrubHub. I've been working for two years with the application DoorDash and GrubHub. Adelante. Estoy trabajando de 10 a 12 horas diarias y estoy ganando de 100 a 120 diarios. Que es, un, eh, es muy poco, ya no alcanza para pagar los biles. I've worked 10 to 12 hours each day and I earn about 100 to 120 dollars a day, which is very little. It's not enough for a living to pay any bills. Adelante. Lo que nosotros le pedimos a, la, a las compañías que nos den un salario eh, digno. ¿Qué quiere decir con esto? Que nos pague por hora. We are asking the companies to give us a dignifying wage. And what do I mean by that is for them to pay us per hour. Adelante. Porque actualmente, eh, en caso de DoorDash y GrabHub, si no hago ni un delivery en una hora, en dos horas, Prácticamente no, no recibo, pero ni un dólar, absolutamente. Like for in the present time with DoorDash and Grubhub, if I don't deliver within one or two hours, then I don't, I don't even get a dollar of payment. Adelante. Eh, tengo un, un caso muy especial de mi persona. Durante un mes perdí dos eh, bicicletas y cada uno vale más de, de 1,500, son 3,000. I have a specific situation in my case. In one month, I lost two bikes, each bike being 1,500. That's 3,000. Adelante. Y al llegar el mes, ya no encuentro qué voy a hacer. Si voy a eh, comprar otra bicicleta o voy a pagar mi, mi renta. Y para mi familia, tengo dos hijas, entonces cuesta mucho decidir qué voy a hacer. And then by the end of the month, I find myself asking myself, what do I do? Do I use my money to buy another bike? Do I pay rent? Do I feed my family? I have two daughters. I find myself in a predicament. Adelante. Además, nosotros los deliveristas, eh, las compañías nos tienen como un contrato de independiente. Que nosotros tenemos que ver con nuestros equipos. Comprar bicicleta, comprar eh, traje de agua, eh, reparaciones, comida. Entonces, eh, nosotros compramos todo nuestro equipo. And then furthermore, the delivery companies, us as delivery people, the companies indicate that we're independent contractors. So then that leaves us having to get our own equipment, our own raincoat, repairs, get our own food. Adelante. Eh, mantener a una familia con esos sueldos de, de 100 diarios, creo que no, no somos capaces de darle una buena vida a nuestra familia. Trying to support ourselves with this kind of money, about $100 a day, it's not possible. How are we supposed to give our families a better life? Adelante. Eh, necesitamos la, la ayuda de, de las autoridades que nos apoyen y que hablemos con, con las compañías, que lleguemos a un acuerdo y que recibamos un, un sueldo fijo para todos. 
We need the help for the authorities to support us, to talk to these companies, to reach some sort of agreement so we can get a fair wage. Adelante. Uh, solamente, muchas gracias. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we'll call on Isabel Navarro and then Pepe Johnson. Gracias. Um, señorita Navarro, me permites una oración, puedo traducir y después siguiente oración. Gracias. Adelante. Eh, sí, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Isabel Navarro. Good afternoon. My name is Isabel Navarro. Adelante. Soy de Leverista en el Bronx. Tengo dos hijos que dependen de mí. Trabajo para las aplicaciones de reparto de comida desde hace seis meses. Y para hacer 500 dólares tengo que trabajar más de 45 horas a la semana. So I live in the Bronx. I have two kids. I work as a delivery person now for six months. For me to get $500, I have to work over 45 hours. Adelante. Necesitamos que estas compañías paguen un salario mínimo por orden para que al menos podamos cubrir los gastos que se requieren para hacer este trabajo. We need the companies to pay at least a minimum amount per hour because that way we could cover all any other costs that are involved sí. with this job. Adelante. Con tres dólares por, or por orden es difícil poder cubrir todos nuestros gastos que conllevan a hacer este trabajo. With three dollars per order, it's very difficult for us even to cover the costs that are needed just to bring about the job. Adelante. Además, a veces estas compañías nos brindan la dirección diferente al destino que es. Furthermore, the companies sometimes give us addresses that are very different from the actual addresses where the deliveries are supposed to go. Adelante. Incluso cuando den más órdenes apenas nos alcanza para pagar los gastos para trabajar como deliveristas. In fact, the more orders they give us, the harder it is to cover all the costs needed just to be a delivery person. Adelante. Estas compañías nos deben brindar también las herramientas necesarias para hacer este trabajo, como, ser, como las bolsas térmicas de buena calidad, ya que a mí me ha pasado que se me han roto cuando he entregado las, los deliveries. And the company should also give us all the necessary tools to bring about the job. For instance, like those um, thermal bags or the bags to keep the food warm or whatever. I've had occasions where they've broken on me on my way to bringing food to the client. Customer, adelante. Básicamente estamos ganando alrededor de 10 dólares por hora. Y los riesgos que conllevan hacer este trabajo son muy altos, incluso a nosotros como mujeres. Basically, what we're earning here is $10 an hour, and the risks involved to do this job are very high. And, and furthermore, I am a woman doing it. Adelante. Y yo les pregunto a ustedes, ¿quién puede vivir en la ciudad de Nueva York con $10 por hora? And I ask you all, who could live in the city of New York on $10 an hour? Adelante. Y tener que comprar todas las herramientas para hacer este trabajo como conlleva a las bolsas de trabajo y equipo para nosotros mismos, transporte y seguro médico, ya que en mi caso yo también he tenido accidentes. And then on top of that, we have to buy our own tools, bags, our own equipment, transportation, even medical insurance. And in my case, I also had an accident on this, doing this job. Adelante. Necesitamos que se paguen estos biles para que las compañías nos paguen un salario que nos permitan vivir con dignidad. Muchas gracias. We need these bills to be paid so that the companies can pay us a dignified wage so we can continue living and earning a living. Thank you. Thank you. We'd like to call on Pepe Johnson next, please. Pepe Johnson, me permites una oración. Después puedo traducir y seguimos adelante. Adelante. Aló, ¿me oye? Sí, Hola. La oigo. Okay, Adelante. Muchas gracias. Mira, mi nombre es Pepe Johnson, soy de West Africa y hago delivery con todos los diferentes tipos de aplicaciones como Google, Dodash, Grand Home, eh, Postman, ya como dos años. My name is Pepe Johnson. I'm from West Africa and I work using these apps, Uber Eats, DoorDash, Grubhub, for about two years now. Adelante. Mira, el mayor de los problemas en los que me enfrento yo personalmente como mujer, y yo sé que muchas mujeres que ya entraron en ese delivery también enfrentan el mismo problema como yo, es el no tener acceso a los baños. 
The problem I have with the job, like many other women, me being as a woman, and I'm sure other women have the same problem, is access to a bathroom. Adelante. Mira, usar el baño es una necesidad de ser humano. Y la compañía de delivery tiene que tener en cuenta que el deliverista no controla el lugar de recoger órdenes ni donde entregar las órdenes. Lo que, lo que nos obliga está a 5 o 10 kilómetros de nuestras casas. The... Using the bathroom is a human necessity, and the companies need to take this into account when they're sending it to all these places that are further than five, six kilometers away from our home. Adelante. Se estamos a distancia muy largas, como cinco o tres, aunque fuera tres kilómetros de nuestra casa, obligatoriamente, si tenemos necesidad físico, solo lo podemos hacer usando los baños de los restaurantes, que no nos lo permiten. So even if you're just going about three kilometers of away and then you find yourself having to use a bathroom, the only bathroom you can really use is the restaurants and the restaurants deny us. Adelante. Y otra de la razón por la cual lo necesitamos de urgencia es también que no controlamos las condiciones clínicas, eh, de, del clima. And the other reason we need it so urgently is because we can't also control the situation with the climate. Adelante. Eh, por ejemplo, en verano, eh, hay, hay, en el verano necesitamos hidratarnos muchísimo y usando las bicicletas más necesidad tenemos para hidratarnos y usar los baños and then during the summer we have to hydrate constantly right and we're using our bikes and we're going around so we're going to need to use the bathrooms at some point por esa razón yo lo pido al gobierno incluyendo la compañía para que entienda y que, y que hable por nosotros para que los porque los para que los restaurantes nos den opción o que nos permiten poder usar sus baños. And that's why I'm asking for the government and the companies to try to understand and to speak for us because the restaurants should at least give us the option of using the bathrooms. Perdón, uno de los uno de los pedidos especial y necesario que yo hago con la compañía que yo pido que la compañía hagan por nosotros es la seguridad de nosotros en la calle como en los buildings, porque ellos no se hacen responsables, pero no exigen a nosotros más. And the last thing that I'm asking for also is for a special need for me that has to do with safety, safety in the streets, safety for us when we are traveling around. We need this. Porque los clientes como tal, que eso también necesitamos, que eso llega a la comunicación para que los clientes entiendan que lo, la compañía no se hace responsable de cualquier cosa que no pasa dentro de un building como fuera de un building. Por eso que muchos no quieren subir a algunos buildings que son buildings de peligro, que son peligrosos para nosotros. nosotros mismos. And I think the clients must understand that the company does not let, help us in finding out where we, have, where we have to go and the high risk of going into some of these buildings. Si la compañía no se hace responsable de todo lo que nos pasa, entonces no deberían castigarnos, descalificándonos y cancelándonos la cuenta por no subir a algunos principios. If the company is not responsible to know what's happening to us, nor should they punish us by blocking us any, blocking us from our account or the app when we decide not to go up into some high-risk building. Well, porque la verdad tenemos eh, compañeros que han muerto y la compañía ni sabe su nombre ni se acuerdan de ellos y es triste. Gracias. In fact, we have, co we have colleagues, co-workers that have died and the company was not even aware or did anything about it to help us. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Gracias por su testimonio. Next, we'll be calling on James Parrott, followed by Sarah Brafman and then Brian Chen. James? Hello, thank you for the opportunity to testify. I support intro 2294 to establish a minimum per trip payment to third party food service uh, workers. This measure builds on the highly successful minimum pay standard for four hire vehicle drivers established in December 2018 by the city's tax and limousine commission following passage of authorizing legislation passed by the council in August of 2018. I co-authored a study 
for the TLC, analyzing the need for the New York City driver pay standard, and also co-authored a July 2020 study for the city of Seattle, analyzing the need for a similar minimum driver pay standard that was enacted in August of 2020. In both cities, the driver pay standards were designed to compensate drivers for all their working time and to account fully for driver's vehicle and other expenses during all of their working time. In an evaluation of the first year of the New York City app dispatch driver pay standard, our research found a high rate of compliance and that driver pay had increased by about 9% or $1.33 per trip. Total driver pay increased by $340 million for the 11 months of 2019 that the pay standard was in effect. Passenger wait times declined and some of the pay increase was absorbed through lower effective commission rates taken by the companies. While passenger fares rose and trip volumes leveled off and declined some in the latter part of 2019, these trends were also evident in Chicago where minimum pay standard was not implemented. Intro 2294 appropriately calls for a study of third party food delivery worker per trip pay and the methods by which that pay is determined. Hours worked and an analysis of delivery worker expenses as well as other pertinent factors and issues. The TLC's ability to effectively regulate driver pay and ensure a high rate of compliance depends in expired. part on the authority the TLC has exercised to require the app companies to provide data on all trips, payments to drivers, hours worked and miles driven. It will be important for the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection to have the authority to similarly compel data sharing by third party delivery services. This is particularly crucial given the experience of delivery workers regarding tip theft and significant data transparency problems. Delivery workers are among the heroes of the pandemic. At great personal health risk, they responded to the explosion in demand for food service uh, delivery over the past year, providing a tremendous service to remote working and homebound New Yorkers and to struggling restaurant owners. Yet they were forced to endure tip theft and extensive payment problems from the delivery companies. They had to deal on their own with the indignity of finding a place to use the bathroom and confronting a wave of bicycle thefts that jeopardized their livelihoods. As contractors, they have no employee rights, no paid sick days, and virtually no access to a worker safety net. Irony or not, the jobs that increased the most during the pandemic were those most devoid of basic worker rights and protections. Thank you. Thank you. I see council member Lander has his hand raised. Council member. Thanks very much, uh, James. Thank you for the work you did to make it possible for us to do the study, you know, to do the study and then establish the driver minimum pay for Uber and Lyft. I appreciate your point and the commissioner made a similar one about the need to compel data from uh, the delivery apps in order to be able to really do this study. Um, do you think that that needs to be included in our legislation? Do we need to amend the legislation or have companion legislation to require the companies to provide that data so that we can do what's necessary to figure out the minimum pay approach? I, I do think that, is in the, that as in the case of the TLC, that company access to do business in New York City should be conditioned on their uh, providing data sharing to appropriate city agencies. So I think you're going to have to legislate that in order to require the companies to do that. Super. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have Sarah Brofman and then Brian Chen and finally Andrew Stetner. Sarah? Your time will begin. Thank you, Chair Ayala, Council Member Reynoso, and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today. I will speak on intro 2163, a critical piece of legislation for New York City restaurant workers. 
I am Senior Policy Counsel at A Better Balance, a national legal nonprofit headquartered in New York City. Our mission is to advance justice for workers so they can care for themselves and their loved ones without compromising their economic security. Here in New York City, we're proud to have helped lead advocacy efforts to support working families, including New York City paid sick and safe time, fair workweek laws, and protections for pregnant and caregiving workers. The sub minimum wage for tipped workers is in effect leg legislated gender inequity for a predominantly female, disproportionately women of color workforce, perpetuating the gender pay gap. Two thirds of tipped workers are women, disproportionately women of color, and of particular importance to us, nearly 40% of them are mothers. In fall 2020, as you heard, uh, restaurants were permitted to charge customers a 10% surcharge. Many customers thought the surcharge was a tip that would benefit workers, not owners, and so reduce reduce their tips as a result, uh, sometimes in half. Intro 2163 doesn't completely resolve this problem, but at least would remedy the particular problems set by the 10% surcharge, allowing restaurant owners to implement a surcharge of up to 15% so long as they pay their tipped employees a full minimum wage with tips on top, will persuade more restaurant owners to share the benefits of the surcharge with their workers rather than have the surcharge cause further harm. And I just wanna say something about the preemption question. And it's important to emphasize that this bill does not run afoul of any limitations on this council's ability to regulate minimum the sub minimum wage. No state law expressly prohibits such a restaurant surcharge. In fact, state law appears entirely silent on the issue of business surcharges. And while New York State's minimum wage law has been interpreted as preempting local minimum wage increases, it is not the case that it would preempt voluntary incentives like this one that encourage employers to pay workers a wage higher than the minimum set by the state. So I'll just end by saying intro 2163 is a pivotal policy to ensure the quality and economic security for New York City's restaurant workers. There's more in our written testimony about all of these issues and especially the preemption issue, which is a non-issue. Thank you very much. And I, you know, we look forward to working with the, with the council to enact 2163. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we'll be calling on Brian Chen, followed by Andrew Stetner, and then Gonzalo Mercado. Your time will begin. Good afternoon, and thank you to the committee for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Brian Chen, and I'm an attorney at the National Employment Law Project, a national nonprofit policy organization that advocates for good jobs and good policies for workers. NELP strongly supports the deliveristas and their five bills being considered today by the council. And I'm submitting a longer written statement, but for time, I'm going to highlight just two things for the committee today. Uh, the first, um, these, these bills are basic, basic protections for an underpaid workforce that is majority immigrant, majority person of color, and that has virtually zero workplace rights under the law as it is now. As some have noted, because these workers are called independent contractors by their employers, they have no practical access to a guaranteed minimum wage, overtime pay, workers' compensation, paid sick leave, and basic health and safety standards under New York state law. And without those state protections, delivery workers are often on the precipice of devastation. So these bills being considered today are long overdue and will help establish a baseline of stability and decent work for workers who are among the most underpaid, marginalized, and exploited. The second point is that greater worker protections and regulation will bring stability to the food delivery industry over the long run. As it is now, app-based food delivery is really like the Wild West. It is dramatically underregulated and therefore very easy for uh, big corporations to exploit workers, diners, and restaurants. If we want to sustain this business model, we need to start with making, sh making uh, sure that the delivery workers have basic protections against low pay and difficult conditions. And in cities that have legislate, legislated gig worker protections before, the sky has not fallen. Seattle has passed premium pay and paid sick leave for app-based workers, the, and the industry adapted and moved on. Philadelphia pay, passed paid sick leave, the industry adapted and moved on. And here in New York, minimum pay for Uber and Lyft drivers resulted in a 9% increase in driver pay. 
The reality is that these common sense protections will bring greater stability to an industry that New York City has come to depend on. These bills are good for food delivery workers, for customers, and for restaurants. We strongly support this package of bills and urge the city council to pass them into law. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, let's see, next we have Andrew Stetner, followed by Gonzalo Mercado and Irene Liu. Andrew? Your time will begin. Good afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity to testify in support of Intro 2163. My name is Andrew Stedner. I'm a senior fellow at the Century Foundation. We're an independent think tank based here in New York. Over the past year, we played a leading role in understanding the impact of COVID-19 on the economy. I commend the council for this concerning this action to rectify deep injustice in the state's wage structure. Under current law, tip workers currently can be paid as little as $10 per hour which is only $13,000 per year for someone who averages 25 hours per week. While the city does not have direct authority to raise this wage, it should do everything in its power to incentivize wage increases. This disparity is even worse for women and people of color who experience the highest rates of sexual harassment compared to any other industry. Providing a minimum wage would help to alleviate the pressure facing women workers. This proposal properly amends the surcharge originally put into place during the pandemic to support restaurants. The original 10% sur surcharge benefited employers with more revenue, yet did not require businesses to pass along the revenue to service workers. This proposed legislation will facilitate the recovery of the economy. With in-person dining reopening, city restaurateurs are bemoaning a labor shortage. Focus groups of immigrant workers connected by the Century Foundation found that many had left the restaurant sector for other work during the pandemic due to the fear of an infection or decline in earnings. These employers who are complaining about worker shortage are really suffering from a wage shortage. With a full minimum wage, workers who will be able to better provide for themselves and employers can, who can attract new workers and preserve the talent would both be able to benefit from the spill. In conclusion, we all know that restaurants are at the heart of New York City's consumer economy. Nothing is more important to the city's recovery than supporting the sector and the workers that are heart of it. Interest 263 is a bold and powerful step in the right direction. Thank you. Before we continue, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Councilmember Rosenthal has joined us. Next, we have uh, Gonzalo Mercado, followed by Irene Liu and then Lisa Orman. Gonzalo? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Gonzalo Mercado, Director of Transnational Initiatives for the National Day Labor and Organizing Network, Andilon. Uh, uh, very happy to provide testimony today. Uh, Andilon's mission is to provide, improve the lives of day laborers, migrant and low wage workers. We build leadership and power among those facing injustice so they can challenge inequality and expand labor, civil and political rights for all. Today, we stand in support of New York City food delivery workers who despite the essential labor provided to keep New Yorkers fed and restaurants running during the worst public health emergency of our generation, while enduring inhumane treatment, wage theft, lack of bathroom access, exclusion from government aid, and even death due to traffic accidents and violent robberies of their electric bikes. This is a pattern that affects app-based food delivery workers, not only in New York City, but nationwide and around the world, while corporations see their profits grow on the back of essential and excluded workers. The Liberistas have been providing this essential work long a long time before the pandemic. And as New York City is reopening, this set of bills and protections are a starting point to recognize the dignity and value that food delivery workers deserve, deserve from all New Yorkers. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to list all of the bills, but I want to make sure that uh, it's noted that we support all of them. By passing this legislative package, New York City can set a model for how localities across the country and around the world can protect the deliveristas from the exploitation of these apps and make sure that no matter how a worker is classified, every worker has dignity and respect. We applaud the work of the Workers' Justice Project and the Liberistas Unidos. Uh, WJP is a member of Andy Lund's 60 member organizations nationwide, and we remain committed to support their efforts to bring recognition and basic dignity to New York City's food delivery workers. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Next, we'd like to call Irene Liu, followed by Lisa Orman, and then Austin Horse. Irene? Your time will begin. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Irene Liu, and I'm a policy analyst at the Community Service Society of New York, a nonprofit that works to lift up low-income New Yorkers. While CSS is supportive of the entire package of bills before the committee today, I'll focus on two of them. Intro 2294 to establish a minimum pay standard for third-party delivery workers, and intro 2163 to allow restaurants to raise the recovery surcharge but require employers to pay their workers a full minimum wage of $15 an hour. First, I would like to highlight our support for intro 2294. Throughout the pandemic, app-based delivery workers have braved the risk of exposure to COVID-19 to keep New Yorkers fed. Yet, as, you, as we've heard today from so many, these workers, many of them low-income and workers of color, continue to struggle with feeding their own families and making the rent. Based, based on the unheard third CSS's annual survey of low-income New Yorkers, we find that the city's app-based gig workers experience food and housing insecurity, as well as difficulties with accessing affordable health care at much higher rates than regular employees. Compared to regular employees, app-based gig workers were more likely to go hungry to fall behind on their rent or delay necessary medical care. App-based gig workers were also more likely to worry about their finances and their ability to make ends meet. Establishing a minimum payment for each trip would be a small but critical first step to improving the economic security of third-party delivery workers who are currently classified as independent contractors and are denied a $15 minimum wage and other essential rights granted to employees. We would also like to express our support for intro 2163, specifically the provision of the bill mandating restaurant employers to pay their workers a full $15 minimum wage without using tips to make up the difference between the lower tipped wage of $10 an hour and the full wage. Similar to the widespread hardship that we saw among app-based gig workers in our unheard third survey data, our previous research has also shown that workers relying on tips suffer higher levels of poverty and hardship than workers covered by the full minimum wage. Guaranteeing restaurant workers a full minimum wage would help ensure predictable income and improve financial stability for this workforce. Low wages, long hours, and adequate safety standards have become the norm for the city's delivery and restaurant workers. For too long, the city has enabled delivery platforms and app-based companies to circumvent labor laws by allowing these companies to choose little to no, with little to no oversight how to compensate their workers how they should be protected. Uh, we strongly urge the council to pass the entire package of bills. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Next, we'd like to call Lisa Orman, followed by Austin Horse, and then Richard Robbins. Lisa? Your time will begin. Hi, my name is Lisa Orman. I am the Chief of Strategy at Open Plans and the Director of Streetopia Upper West Side. On the Upper West Side, we've been fighting for decades for safer bike infrastructure. For many, this is about getting their kids to school safely or being able to bike to work safely. For others, like delivery workers, the streets are literally their working conditions. They risk their lives day in and day out in order to feed people in this city, which became even more necessary and visible over the past year. Ken Coughlin, a board member of Streets PAC and a board member of Manhattan Community Board 7, recently proposed a resolution on the Upper West Side at CB7, simply asking restaurants to allow delivery workers to use their bathrooms. Listening during these meetings has been both saddening and maddening, but it's also exposed so many people to the idea that working conditions for delivery workers are not fair, just, or humane. I am proud that the city council is discussing these vital bills. Los Deliveristas and all delivery workers deserve a fair wage, transparency with their tips, safe and fair working conditions, including bike infrastructure, and a place to use the bathroom. Tonight, we'll be back at CB7 fighting a bid to ban e-bikes from protected bike lanes. Make no mistake, this resolution is targeted directly at deliveristas. We need to support our essential workers, not target them again and again. We strongly support the passage of these bills. We hope that future bills will address the app's incentive structures, which force delivery workers to choose between getting paid and following all of the traffic laws. Instead of blaming workers for biking the wrong way or going too fast, Let's figure out what, why they feel the need to deliver meals so quickly and change that. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we have Austin Horse, followed by Richard Robbins. Austin? Your time will begin. Oh, 
Hi there. Thank you so much. Um, I actually come to speak really to some history with, with food delivery in New York City. I was uh, I've been a food delivery person. I started doing that in 2006, actually, before these apps came along. And at that time, we actually had great relationships. You would often work for just a restaurant or a, a group of restaurants. And it was, a, it was a much better environment. I would routinely make 20 to $25 an hour doing that. Uh, it was very reliable. It was actually once app companies started to compete with us that I was laid off from restaurants as they switched from uh, having the in-house delivery model to this third-party independent contractor model uh, because it was cheaper for the restaurants. So as far as regulation going to um, um, either, either to, to affect these restaurants and force them to uh, allow bathroom access and maybe even charge them a little bit more for, for their delivery people, this is a good thing because they made this switch um, almost 10 years ago when they went off of um, when they went to the apps. And then for the third party apps, for the independent contractors, they operate with a, an independent contractor model that shields them from, from workers comp. So any other delivery business utilizing bikers needs to pay 30 to $40, 30 to 40, 30 to 40 cents on the dollar for every payroll, for, uh, for payroll, which is a huge burden. And so they're already existing outside of this. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. Finally, we have Richard Robbins. Richard? Your time will begin. I thank you very much. My name is Richard Robbins. I live on the Upper West Side and I'm testifying in my personal capacity, not as a CB7 board member. As someone who cares about transportation safety in New York City, I've been to countless transportation meetings. Without fail, at these meetings, people call for greater enforcement of bikes and e-bikes. While I ride a bike for transportation, I wanted to better understand delivery riders' experience and signed up for DoorDash. Last month, I tried working and followed every traffic law, stopping at every red light. In one hour, I got no orders, making no money. Then this past Sunday, in the 90 degree heat, DoorDash sent me alerts about how busy they were, so I tried again. In 90 minutes, while following every law, I made three deliveries and earned $22.50, exactly minimum wage, only because they were really busy. Incidentally, my last delivery was picking up dinner that my wife ordered at Ollie's for $47, three hours of work. In doing this, I saw a number of troubling issues. New York City already has laws that businesses must provide delivery cyclists with unique three-digit ID number tags, reflective apparel with the business name and the bicyclist's, bicyclist's three-digit ID number and a helmet. But the third-party delivery services evade these laws, as well as minimum wage law, liability laws, OSHA bathroom requirements, and requirements to provide equipment by making delivery cyclists independent contractors. In fact, DoorDash did not even inform me of the New York City laws when I signed up for their service. We need to fix this. Further, DoorDash didn't, uh, the DoorDash system didn't provide apartment numbers and the messaging system to customers didn't work. It told me to leave food outside and take a picture. After the first customer yelled at me for the second delivery, I rang every one of the 15 buzzers in the building to alert the person that her quarter pounder was downstairs. I couldn't believe I was doing it. And now I see why delivery riders wake me up doing that in my building. Upton Sinclair wrote, it is difficult for a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. If we wanna make our streets safer for all the pedestrians who are terrified of bikes, not to mention for our delivery cyclists, we need to address the economic issue. Without a fair wage, we can't expect delivery workers to follow laws. We also need to make third party delivery account, uh, companies accountable, ideally by making uh, time as employees and not independent contractors. Thank you very much. Thank you. If we have inadvertently missed anyone who has registered to testify today and has yet to be called, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be called on in the order that your hand was raised. Seeing no hands raised, I will now turn it over to Chair Ayala to offer closing remarks. Chair? Thank you. Um, I just really, really want to thank all of you for coming today, for staying, um, for exercising patience. I know it's been a long hearing, but it's an important hearing. Um, and I think that we've all learned a lot today about what it takes to be a deliverista in New York City and all of the ways that we can make this better. Um, it has been my pleasure to uh, chair this hearing today, and I look forward to uh, passing this, uh, this set of, of, of bills. Um, relatively soon. So thank you all. And with that, this hearing is adjourned.